food and the effects of the changing climate on the carbon cycle. So please welcome Dr. Sophie Fielding. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very, very happy to be able to come here today uh, and talk about the capabilities, the cool science capabilities uh, of the Sir David Attenborough. Um, so, uh, when we talk about polar science, this can be very broad. Um, it includes areas such as space weather, uh, it includes areas such as paleo, paleo oceanography, uh, ice dynamics, ecosystems, biodiversity. And as a result, um, polar science includes work that occurs on the land, uh, on ice, and in the sea, uh, as well as in the air. This means that we need a ship that has the ability to carry our cargo to our stations. It has the ability to house helicopters that enables it to do search and rescue, as well as to put field parties into those land-based sites. Uh, and of course, uh, it needs the marine research technology uh, so that we can do that state-of-the-art science that provides the evidence uh, that informs kind of the information on how our climate is changing because we know it's changing and how those mitigation procedures that are going to be discussed at COP26 next week, uh, how they are actually impacting the environment uh, and this ship will be providing the evidence uh, in data in terms of knowing whether those mitigation procedures are working, what the feedback is in the systems uh, and whether, for example, the organisms are, are resilient to those kind of changes. So the SDA was commissioned by NERC. It was built by Camel Laird uh, in the, on the Mersey, um, and it's operated by the British Antarctic Survey uh, for UK and international scientists to do environmental research. It's a large ship, you may have noticed. Uh, it's 129 metres long, 24 metres wide, and it actually has quite a shallow draft for that kind of ship. It's seven metre draft. And that's to enable it to go in uh, to, to some of our base, uh, some of our stations um, that are in these remote areas, uh, and actually they need to need to be able to go in quite close to them. So it has this shallow draft. The endurance is 60 days. Um, the range is about 19,000 nautical miles, uh, and I believe if we work that out, that's about from here to Antarctica and back again. Uh, and it has 30 crew and it can house up to 60 scientists. Um, there are some talks later on, I believe our captain is presenting a talk later on, and he'll describe some of the kind of living conditions on the ship uh, and a bit more detail on, the, uh, on, on, on how it functions. Polar class five, random classification. That essentially means that she can uh, make her way through first season ice, so ice that's been created the, just so, you know, the year before, um, that's about a metre thick. So this ship, she is ice strengthened, uh, and it's a subtle difference between what you consider an ice breaker, which will really kind of ram much thicker ice. Um, so polar science is multidisciplinary, uh, and some of the key research priorities are listed here. So we know it's atmosphere and global connections, it's ocean climate linkages, it's carbon cycling and biogeochemistry. Um, when we consider oceans and society, what we're thinking about is food security. We're thinking about how people live near the oceans, what that impact is, biodiversity and conservation, and ocean interfaces. So this is a really multidisciplinary uh, arena that we want to be able to have the ship capable of doing. And the way we did that with the Sir David Attenborough is we actually took scientists from all of these disciplines uh, to come and champion what they wanted on the ship, what capabilities did they need to have. Um, and so I will kind of allude to some of the science that we will do, and I'll present you some of the capabilities that were really driving that. Uh, so the Sir David Attenborough has 12 decks, uh, and it actually has science bases uh, all around. And if we start, I don't know, actually, I didn't check whether the laser works on here. So if we start at the bottom of the ship, on the hull, uh, we have a suite of acoustic instruments. And um, essentially, light in the oceans is attenuated very quickly, um, which means that essentially the surface oceans are quite light, 
But actually, once you start getting below 50 to 100 metres, you don't have a lot of uh, light to, to see anything. <coughs> so as a result, we have to use something different to observe what's in the water. Uh, and so we use sound. So we have about 18 transducers fitted to the bottom of the hull to undertake different science. Uh, as we move through, we obviously have the engine spaces, uh, cargo storage, and then we get into the main working deck, which is the real area where we do our science from. Uh, and so we have the, the aft deck, as it's called, uh, and we have our scientific deployment positions. We have a mass of laboratory facilities that run all the way through the ship here, and I'll show you a few of those. Uh, and then we even have, just above the bridge, which is that yellow dot there, we have a further laboratory right at the top of the ship. So in the UK, we always like to talk about weather. Uh, essentially, we know right, that the polar air masses influence both the UK as well as the global climate. Um, so we want to, to use mobile platforms to go out and make measurements uh, of the weather. So when I say measurements of that weather, we have standard MET equipment on the ship uh, that will measure things like wind speed and air pressure. Um, but we also are very interested, actually, in the suspended particles within the atmosphere. So these are aerosols, uh, and um, they can influence our climate. So they have both natural and anthropogenic, that's man-made origins, um, and the lifetime of an aerosol in the atmosphere is from a few minutes to a few weeks. Hence, it's very important that we can take our measurements to wherever it is that, that we need to go. Now, it's really important. If you want to make measurements of the air, you don't really want to make them right where the ship is or right where the exhaust is from the ship because you're measuring the footprint of the ship. You're not measuring the footprint of the environment. So at a very early phase when the ship was in design, uh, they had to actually create an airflow model over the ship to inform how they were going to put things on the vessel. So all of our atmospheric, uh, all of our MET observations and atmospheric observations incur in two places. One in that kind of Titanic style front of the ship area, so you're right there without any kind of influence from the ship, and then uh, a suite also up towards here where you're trying to get as high as you can. You're just in front of the exhaust so that you're not actually getting influence from there. And our, uh, our scientists, they, they really don't like to have the influence of the ship interfering with their measurements. And so we actually had to create an air intake pipe that brings air all the way from here to one of our first laboratories that sits just here on the vessel. So what I'm just showing you now is the foremast uh, with the atmospheric facilities. Now, what I mentioned earlier on, in fact, uh, is that we obviously have a heli deck on the front of the ship. And if you stick a mast in the way, uh, they don't really like that. Um, so one of the interesting features of the vessel is actually that that whole mechanism has to fold down so that the helicopters can come and land on the vessel. So it really introduces some quite technical challenges when you're designing a ship. You know, ordinarily, we just put this feature on and it would be fine. And then somebody kind of comes along and goes, that's going to get in the way. Uh, and I'd say that that's really been the balance all the way through this design. You know, it's, it's a complex ship uh, with competing uh, agendas. And so here I'm just showing you now at the moment, uh, you have those inlet lines on the foremast. Uh, and we have helicopter on deck. And, and then our, uh, our atmospheric and aerosol laboratories we, we can work on. So in addition to that, in polar regions, um, polar regions are the source of the deep ocean cold waters that influence our global ocean circulation. Uh, so we know that there are warm surface waters, um, they're depleted in nutrients, they've got carbon dioxide, they're traveling pole, polewards, um, and that's where they give up heat to the atmosphere, uh, where ice is created. And as water becomes cold and salty, it sinks. Uh, and then as it sinks at depth at the poles, it then spreads back towards the equator. So that's our global ocean circulation. That's one of our massive mechanisms for taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it down at depth. And we always talk about that a lot because essentially that's what we want to do. We want to try and remove carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere and to get it pushed 
down below 1,000 metres. Once, once carbon reaches 1,000 metres, it's going to be 1,000 years before it comes back into our, into our, you know, into our surface environment, if you like. Um, so the linchpin kind of mechanism that we use to make those measurements is something called a CTD, and that's on the right-hand side. So t CTD is conductivity, temperature, uh, depth recorder. It's just a sensor package here, lots of sensors on there. And then what you will be able to see are these water bottles uh, attached to this. And these water bottles, they all sit on springs, they go down empty into the ocean, and then essentially we decide where we want to get a parcel of water they close and it brings that parcel of water back up with it. So we can go down to 6,000 metres with that CTD. We can close on on that parcel of water, bring it up and then analyse it. Uh, and the, so David Attenborough actually has two uh, locations. So just get which side we're seeing from here. Uh, so this is the starboard side of the ship. It's the right hand side of the ship. So these big yellow features, when you look at the SDA, you'll see one on the aft deck, you'll see these two here. These are the key deployment mechanisms for putting instruments over the side of the ship. Uh, so this one is a, a kind of general, what we call an A-frame. You'll lift up a piece of equipment, it will lean over, and then it gets deployed down. And this one here is this more bespoke mechanism that sucks packages up, holds it in a frame, and then pushes it out and puts it down into the sea. Why do we care about that? Why do we want it to suck up into a frame? Because when you're out in the open ocean, the waves are five or six metres, you're selecting the time that you're actually putting your instrument into the water very carefully. Uh, and recognising that, um, you know, uh, <coughs> we know Southern Ocean is a place where we talk about the roaring 40s, the furious 50s, the <laughs> Um, you know, we know our weather systems down there are intense. Uh, we get some, some extreme weathers, and then obviously as we go further south, we get colder and colder. So working at the side of the ship is actually quite an exposed location. It's a dangerous location. Uh, and so the Sir David Attenborough has an additional site that you can deploy instruments in, and it's called a moon pool, right? So this moon pool is in the science hangar of the ship. It's four metres by four metres, and it's a hole in the ship, all the way down, open, sea comes in. So sea level height in that moon pool is the same as if you looked over the side, but it's right in the center. It's in the center because that's the center of gravity. It's the point of least motion. So it's a very uh, minimal kind of motion area, which means that we'll be able to deploy equipment in weather that's kind of worse than, than we would normally do over the side. Uh, and also another key thing is actually it's, um, it's contained within a science hangar. Uh, and that's quite important for, for exposure. So not only for people, because obviously, as we know, you can get frostbite, you know, weather conditions for that, but actually a lot of our equipment will ice up when we're putting it over the side or when we bring it back. And if you have equipment that ices up, it means it usually fails because your springs and everything else that are making it react, um, they, they ice up and they don't work. Uh, and actually, one of the problems, I, I showed that CTD beforehand that will collect parcels of water, when that comes up and it's exposed to really cold temperatures, the water freezes and I can't take my sample. So there's some really simple things that make this work very well. This is called the moon pool cursor, and this descends all the way down through the moon pool to the bottom and then deploys the wire. Um, the reason for that, again, the worst thing that you want is a metal wire seesawing against the side of your ship. Um, so you want to put that wire right at the bottom. Um, so as we move through, uh, looking from the kind of physics of the oceanography, we move into the chemistry of the oceans. Uh, and as I said, storage and transfer and transformation of carbon and nutrients from the water column into the seabed is a really important component of the work that we do from this vessel. So this is our way of taking atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere. It comes into the water. Uh, it's then photosynthesized by the small microscopic plants, uh, algae. Those algae are fed upon by zooplankton. Those zooplankton go down, they poo, they die, they molt, uh, and that's actually a key driver of carbon coming out of the surface waters uh, and being sequestered at depth. Um, so the Southern Ocean is one of these areas that we call high nutrient, low chlorophyll. Uh, and by that, what we mean is that all of those kind of nitrogen, 
phosphorus, silicate nutrients that, that you know, we really think are normally in associated with growth, they're very high, but actually we have very, or we can have very low levels of algae. And the reason for that is actually uh, there's quite a limitation on the growth in the Southern Ocean uh, by a micronutrient, which is iron. Um, and so what you find is, is that whilst there's, there's low levels of chlorophyll across the whole of the Southern Ocean, where you get those island interfaces, where you get those fronts, you get this productivity that is all the iron coming off the sediment and coming into the water column. Um, so it's really important that we understand uh, trace metal chemistry. So essentially, iron concentrations in the Southern Ocean uh, are around what we call 0.1 nanomoles. Uh, and I was trying to work out what this meant. So, so essentially, it's like a mobile phone's worth of iron in the Thames. And that's what we're trying to detect, dissolved in the Thames. Um, and so, as you can imagine, if you're on a big metal ship, um, trying to detect those kind of levels means that you have to go to quite a lot of measures. And that's what we've done with the Sir David Attenborough. So this is what we call our clean chemistry winch. It's in its own space. Uh, it has a polyester jacket, which means that kind of steel cable has a, a plastic jacket around it to try and minimise any, any iron that's coming off that. Um, we came back, we have a, a titanium CTD. Uh, so titanium is a really good element to make these things out. It's very strong uh, and it's very resistant to corrosion uh, and therefore the way of getting metals into the water. Uh, and we have these all plastic bottles uh, to collect our samples with, as well as our titanium sensors. And so finally, we have this dedicated laboratory. So this is our clean chemistry laboratory. It's actually still being finished off there. <laughs> so it's got a few contaminants in it at the moment. Um, but essentially, once you've got your water sample up on your CTD frame, you put it into the deck and then you take it into this laboratory. You'll be there. Everything in there has the metal either removed and replaced with plastic or it has it covered. And that's the kind of area where scientists, they'll be looking for those trace metals, but they'll also be looking at those new techniques that you see. Things like looking at environmental DNA, where you're using the, the genetic makeup of cells in the water to actually look at what organisms live there. Um, and we also use laboratories very similar to this and facilities to look at microplastics. So trying to understand how microplastics impact the organisms that are living in the water, what concentrations there are. Um, so once carbon dioxide goes into water, and as it increases in the atmosphere, it actually increases the acidity of the oceans. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, and so oceanic uptake of carbon dioxide, uh, it can impact ecosystem functioning uh, and transfer, transfer of carbon and energy. Um, so uh, it's potential that there will be areas of the Southern Ocean um, that are undersaturated uh, in aragonite. So this is this, this effect of uh, acidification um, on, on kind of things like calcium shells. If we think about our, our chalk cliffs of Dover, this is where we're starting to talk about that kind of carbonate, calcium, aragonite system. And this is a uh, winged snail. Uh, it's a flying snail, essentially. So this is the shell. It's made of aragonite. And it is these organisms where potentially their shell will be dissolving because of the acidity of the ocean that's been caused by the increased amounts of carbon dioxide in it. Uh, and what we need are those really special technologies like scanning electron microscopes uh, to come in and to um, look at what's happening to those animals whilst we're out on the ship. And then we can work out what samples we want to take um, in order to look at the effect. So this is, again, you know, what's our, what's our mitigation into the future in terms of putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? The more we put in, the more acidic places in the ocean are going to become. The influence will change the food webs that are there. Uh, we have other new technology with their own deployment systems. And so this is a multi-beam sonar. Uh, and in one ping, it can insonify, it can make a picture of a whole krill swarm. Um, and so we've had to be very specific. So with a nice strengthened vessel, uh, you can't really just uh, put acoustic instruments on the bottom. You actually have to cover them with titanium plates uh, or polyester plates to protect them. Or in this case, we have to make specific deployment mechanisms to, to protect them. Um, we also still use nets. 
Uh, and a key feature, actually, of the ship is it has one winch that has 12,000 metres of wire on it. And the reason for that is if you want to actually measure the deepest parts of the Southern Ocean, you have to be able to deploy your instruments to 8,000 metres. So just here, this is the South Sandwich Islands, and it's in the South Atlantic. Uh, and this is an example of a, a benthic sledge, so a, a sledge that will trawl uh, around the seabed looking at small organisms. And what we know is, you know, every time this net goes out and it goes to those depths, we will find a new species. Um, you know, we, we know more, we always say, right, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about some of the really deep parts of our own planet. Uh, and this is just, again, using that scanning electron microscope and how taxonomists use it to identify what new species might be there. Uh, so at the bow of the ship, uh, we have the heli deck. Um, and this is a new facility for, for our vessel. Uh, and uh, not only do we intend to, um, to deploy helicopters from that, but if you haven't been looking over the last few days, it's the ideal place to kind of start to embrace those new technologies of using drones. And in fact, the ship itself has its own drone so that when it gets into the ice and it wants to find its way through, it will actually put a drone up and it will look for leads in the ice so that it can navigate its way out of that area. Uh, it is a ship, uh, and so essentially it carries, uh, it carries its own work boats. The last thing you're going to do is take a 129-metre uh, ship into a fjord and right up to the edge of a terminating glacier. Uh, it's a, so what we need to do then is take our work boats, so we have our own small work boat here, and it's kitted out with a variety of of different equipment for people to go and look at those marine terminating glaciers. Marine terminating glaciers are really important because they are the ice-water interface. Uh, and, you know, they, they are, again, an area we're very interested in the, um, the, the melting of the under, underneath of these glaciers and how it inputs nutrients into the ocean. Um, so, finally, I've been told, no talk about Sir David Attenborough, um, would be complete if we didn't talk about some of the autonomous technologies that we can use for her. So one of the things about the ship is we've put these state-of-the-art facilities on it so that scientists from lots of different disciplines can go to sea and they can have the laboratory techniques that they need to understand the animals, the water, the rocks, whatever subject it is that they bring onto the ship. So that's a scientific footprint. But we need to expand that footprint both spatially and temporally Okay, and you know, we don't necessarily want to use our very large ship to do that. So what's really important is that we use these new emerging autonomous technologies to take that time and that space footprint and widen it up and scale up our measurements. So Boaty McBoatface is one of those autonomous vehicles that goes under the ice. It will take those measurements and it will come back. We have things like, uh, well, it's not quite an autonomous vehicle in this case, we have things like the remotely operated vehicle. This is ISIS, uh, it's operated by the um, NOC, the National Oceanography Center. That will go to 6,000 meters, it will go to the hydrothermal vents that are at the bottom of the sea, uh, and it will take samples and manipulate you know, experiments at 6,000 meters in the water column. Um, so finally, uh, I wanted to say thank you very much for your attention. And I also wanted to point to the fact that there is a, uh, a virtual tour um, of the Sir David Attenborough on the British Antarctic Survey's website. So if you visit www.bass.ac.uk, uh, you can actually go and step through the Sir David Attenborough uh, on its interactive tour. And I, I would really encourage you to do so to get a feel of the scale of the ship because she is an amazing ship. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks very much, Sophie, for a fantastic tour of the uh, Sir David Attenborough. We do have time for just one or two questions. If anyone from the audience would like to ask anything, please feel free. Yes, right at the front here, go for it.
Okay, so the question is, uh, if the ship were ever to get stuck or uh, unable to go any further into the ice, uh, what would uh, happen? How would you continue to explore around? Okay, so the ship has a very special uh, system. It's called an ice healing system. And it's essentially, it's a U-shaped system on the ship, and it can actually transfer water, ballast, from side to side. So say the ship got stuck in ice, it would basically pump water from side to side on the ship, so it would wobble, okay? And that's what these ice strengthening ships are supposed to do. So as your ice is closed in and as you wobble, you're basically shrugging that ice off. And if that didn't work, it has a, well, you can't see it on this picture, a 50-ton crane, which is a very, very heavy, big crane. Uh, and what that would do is actually, if that crane also swings from side to side, the whole ship will swing from side to side and it will eventually make its way out of the ice. Uh, and so then it will be able to continue on its journey. I'm sure the people on the boat were very happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, so uh, one more question then. Yeah, go for it. That's, that's a very good question. So uh, the question is, uh, if the uh, ship were to sink, um, would the water in the moon pool actually rise up with it, or is there a way to stop the water from completely overtaking the ship? An interesting point. So, so, the water, so the moon pool is like having a bit of the outside, but on the inside. So if the ship sank, the water would rise. Yeah? But it's all sealed so essentially, it's not going to sink because water comes through the moon pool. Uh, it's very important. Uh, it's all to do with whether or not you have open or closed spaces around your water. So the, the moon pool itself is, is essentially like having a bottomless swimming pool, uh, but all the sides are sealed. So as long as the water doesn't get into other parts of the ship and it just stays in the moon pool, it's not going to change its height. But the waves might make it a bit rocky. <laughs> well, fantastic questions here. So uh, thank you very much one, uh, once again to Dr. Sophie Fielding. Thank you. So we have more talks running all the way through the day, so do feel free to come back for those. And also, do, don't forget to go and check out all the exhibits up on the great map. There are some fantastic things there to go and have a look at. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.
<laughs> I love the multiple question. you know, for three days in a row. Oh. <laughs> uh, the what? The oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm Hi, good morning. My name is Natalia from the where am I from? Antarctic Infrastructure Modernization Program. Okay. Again? Yes. Natalia will be presenting on sustainability. About carbon.
Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the National Maritime Museum uh, and to our Ice Worlds Festival in partnership with the British Antarctic Survey. My name is Dr Greg Brown, I'm going to be your host for today's talk. Just before we begin, uh, if you have been uh, looking to join some of our activities and various things happening today uh, which are ticketed and haven't been able to so far or if you haven't looked just yet, um, do take a look at the front of your programme. There is a QR code you can scan. Uh, more tickets have been opened up over the course of the last day so maybe you might be able to get on some of those activities today. So do take a look at those. Uh, throughout today we're going to be having all sorts of talks on all sorts of subjects which I'm very much looking forward to seeing myself and we are delighted to have uh, Nopi Exesidou and uh, Natalia Ford uh, who are going to be talking to you right now. So uh, Nopi is the Senior Carbon Manager and uh, Net Zero Transition Lead uh, for the British Antarctic Survey. Um, and uh, Natalia is the Sustainability Manager uh, for the Antarctic Infrastructure Modernization Program. Um, so if we could please uh, welcome Nopi Exizadu and Natalia Ford. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome. Natalia and I are going to talk to you about net zero, our efforts on how we can reduce our emissions in Antarctica and also around sustainability and how we can uh, deliver construction, a construction program in a more sustainable way. Um, so a little bit about uh, what our plans are. So the British Antarctic Survey has committed to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2040. And you see here in, on this slide our key pillars of, of our strategy. So we are looking at identifying ways we can deliver net zero, um, uh, net zero science for the future, so delivering our science in a, in a net zero future, how we can do that. So looking a lot inwards, the ways that we can Im Im improve our operations to reduce emissions, but also looking outwards. So how can our science um, further facilitate and support global efforts of climate change uh, mitigation? A lot of our focus at the moment is on infrastructure, so um, decarbonizing our state, our offices in Cambridge and our stations in Antarctica. So we are looking at a combination of different ways from renewables, automation, uh, and I'm going to talk to you more about in the, in the next few slides. Um, transport and logistics is a big challenging area. So we use uh, shipping, so our ship, the Sir David Attenborough, uh, to deliver our logistics and science uh, in the Antarctic. And we also use a fleet of five aircraft to support our science delivery program. So these are very difficult areas to decarbonize and technology is not there yet uh, to help us do that. But we are focusing our efforts in improving operational efficiency and, and other things that we can do to reduce our impact in this area. Um, supply chain, um, we are looking at how we can work closely together with our suppliers um, to develop common goals and values around sustainability. Um, and we are also trying to understand what the impact of, of, our full, of our supply chain is on our carbon footprint. So a lot of work to be done in this area in the next few years. Uh, and community. The good news is that we are not alone in this. So we do work in partnerships with the industry and academia, not only to help us meet our net zero commitments, but also to help with the uptake of low carbon technologies. So a few examples of what, we, of what we are trying to do, what we've done so far and what our plans is, are for the future. So this is our uh, headquarters in Cambridge, our offices, and you can see uh, we have invested a lot in solar panels. Um, so uh, the solar is helping us meet 30 to 40 percent of our electricity, and we've also switched to renewable grid electricity, so we get the remaining from the grid in a renewable format. Um, also we are trying to promote more sustainable ways of commuting to work. Um, we, we, our offices are in Cambridge, so a lot of people cycle in Cambridge. More than 50% of our staff are cycling to work, so this is great news. And we have increased our storage capacity for, cyc for cyclists so that they can have a, a, a secure space to um, uh, uh, have their bike in. Um, also installed uh, electric vehicle charging points, uh, so electric uh, vehicles are becoming more and more popular now. Um, in Cambridge, we're also trying to move away from natural gas, so changing our boilers to a combination of ground source and air source heat pumps. So this is quite challenging, but this is the plan uh, for uh, the near future for in a couple of years. 
Rodera Research Station is uh, the largest station that we have in Antarctica. So we aim to achieve zero emissions on this station by 2030. And to do that, we are looking at a uh, different combination of technologies such as wind turbines, solar PVs, different energy storage systems, so batteries and, and thermal storage systems, um, and also electrifying the local vehicles or, or the, the vehicles that we have uh, locally on station to support our logistics. Um, Baird Island Research Station is a much smaller station, so Rodera uh, can host 150 people. Baird Island is, is a much smaller station, around eight people. Um, the plan is to uh, install solar panels next year or on the, all of the roofs that you see on the buildings there um, and also have a battery system on, on site and that will help us reduce our fuel use by 50%. So solar is a really robust technology that we use. It's almost maintenance free um, and we can get a lot out of it, especially during the summer months where we have um, uh, the sun out. Um, more challenging during winter time where we need to find other technologies to support us during winter. Uh, we have another station at King Edward Point and, and here there is a lake, uh, an existing dam and we have a hydropower plant there um, and the hydropower plant help us to meet 80% of our demands in electricity and, and, and heating. And our plan is also we've got funding to increase that so we will add a new micro hydropower plant next year and that will help us um, increase that percentage to 90%, so very close to net zero here. We are also exploring new ways of working. So we are looking at how automation can help us uh, achieve some of our decarbonization targets. At Halley Research Station, we have developed an automated power supply and that is helping us run the station unmanned for nine months of the year and still generating electricity to, to uh, provide the supply to uh, scientific equipment. And that way we can save 75% 75, 75 of the fuel. Automation can help us in other areas as well, so we're trying to identify how to use automation in shipping and aviation to f further decrease emissions in, in, this, in these areas. As I said, transport and logistics is our biggest challenge, um, but we've learned a lot of lessons through COVID. So we know that we need to reduce flight emissions and we know that we can work virtually now. So at the moment we're developing a travel strategy that will help support uh, reduce emissions in, in, in the near future. For the Sir David Attenborough, we, we've got funding to develop a digital twin that is using artificial intelligence and the data that we collect on the ship to develop a tool basically that will help the masters of the ship take more informed decisions on, for example, um, the speed of the ship, the speed of the vessel and also the routing. So, using that data that we collect to, do, to take more informed decisions on optimize fuel use on, on board. Achieving net zero carbon in Antarctica is not an easy task and, and it has a lot of challenges. However, the good news is that there's great momentum at the moment. We've got the UK net zero strategy announced last week. We've got the UN sustainable development goals that can help us develop our strategies. And we've got global efforts of governments, the industry that, that help with that momentum. Um, renewable energy technology also has uh, reduced its cost a lot uh, in, the, in the last decade, significantly, I can say. And we've got new promising technology coming up uh, to help us reduce emissions in shipping and aviation. So I'm talking about hydrogen, ammonia, and other fuels that are being uh, currently under development. All of that reducing fuel will help us improve our, our energy security and also our, our financial security. But most importantly, it will help us increase our resilience so that we can continue to deliver world-class environmental science in Antarctica. And Natalia, I will hand over to Natalia, who's gonna to talk to you more about uh, sustainability and what we do there. Okay, afternoon everyone. So, um, I'm Natalia. Uh, I've got 10 minutes to talk to you about sustainability um, in our construction work. So, I'm going to talk about four things. What we're building and why. Um, why is building in Antarctica different to building in the UK? Um, how we're trying to do that in the most sustainable way possible and talk about some of the challenges that we have around decarbonising just on that particular point and particularly around renewable energy. And there'll be time for questions at the end. 
So um, why are we building? So Rotherham Station has been there since the 60s, and some of the buildings that have been there um, date back to that time. Um, there's, there's a couple there that have been there since the early 70s, I think. And um, as you can imagine, they're quite battered. They're, quite, uh, they're aging, they need replacing, and they're, they're not really fit for purpose anymore. Um, so we have a 10-year-plus construction program, uh, which is government-funded, and um, it's, going, it's around um, 0.3 billion pounds worth of work. Um, to replace a lot of the infrastructure that we have in Antarctica. So at the moment, if you were in Antarctica, you would see our new wharf, um, which can now dock the uh, Sir David Attenborough ship. Um, and we are partway through building the Discovery Building, which is our new science and operations building. And that will take around three or four seasons of work. The next few projects in the pipeline are a new uh, big upgrade to the runway and a new aircraft maintenance facility and um, looking at our energy infrastructure, which, um, as Nopi has mentioned, is, is likely to change. And the whole point of this is that we have a huge opportunity to change how the station actually operates. Um, and in that, the, the carbon equation gets quite interesting. But what we're aiming for is a world-class polar research science center in Antarctica um, that's energy efficient, that's resilient, and that's future-proofed for at least the, the next 25 years. So why is building so different down there? Well, as you can imagine, the risks are really, really high. We are an incredibly remote continent. Um, it's really, really, really far away. Um, if anything goes wrong um, in terms of we might order the wrong stuff, um, then there's nowhere really, you can't nip down to home base to get extra timber or anything like that. So one of the things that we're doing is building digitally first. So everything, um, the model, um, the digital twin that we're building around every single asset is quite advanced. Um, and it helps to make sure that we do bring the right materials with us, um, that we don't over-order as well, which is another issue, um, as space is quite constrained in, um, on the site. So that's Rothera there. That little rocky outcrop is 0.4 square kilometers of land, and that's the only ice-free land in that area where you can actually build um, with foundations. And it does mean that we have to balance what we build. So if you're thinking of siting a building or a wind turbine or solar panels, you have to think about what's the best thing for the station in terms of we have to deliver science. That's the whole reason that we're there. So is it better to put a wind turbine or is it better to put solar energy or is, do we just need a, a new building? Is that what the best thing for the site? Um, so we spend a lot of time trying to reduce the risks uh, a lot, spend a lot of time planning. Um, but equally, um, I think the thing that everyone really enjoys hearing about is that we also have to interact with a really interesting environment. Um, so the, the weather is obviously a challenge. Um, so we only have a very short season. It's 16 weeks that we get to build um, as much as possible. Um, and in that time, we, we might get visited by the, these lovely selection of animals. So penguins and seals, where we will literally have to move them off the runway and move them off um, the, the, the areas where we're actually trying to build. Um, we have instructions on how to remove elephant seals using flags and all this kind of thing. Um, and and the, wild, the, the, the nesting birds, we have a nesting bird site at Rothera, which needs a bank. And it's quite small. But it's the only, um, it's one of the very few examples of moss growing in Antarctica. There's, there's very little flora in Antarctica for obvious reasons. It's a desert, it's very cold, very windy. So um, that moss bank deserves just as much protection as an emperor penguin. And so that can get quite interesting when you're trying to build things, which, you know, you need, you need space, you need people moving around a lot. Um, and, you know, everything deserves um, protecting. And we do need to pay a lot of attention to managing our impacts. So the first thing that we did was create a sustainability strategy, uh, which sounds incredibly um, dull, but actually this, is, um, this uh, helps us uh, create a really good decision-making framework. So when we're looking at things like cost, program, um, the amount of resources that we need, we are also looking at other factors as well to make sure that those impacts get managed. And it's not just about the, uh, the typical environment. One of the most important things that we need to think about is how we create a healthy working environment. We've got people who are living at Rothera for 18 months. So they, you know, they need to be in the warm for a lot of that time in order to, to do really, really good science. Um, so looking at things like indoor air quality is, has become really important to us as well. 
Um, so in an office environment where you've got people, lots of people working and breathing, uh, you get a buildup of CO2, which can make you unproductive. It can make CO2 is not, not good for us in terms of our indoor air environment and in the atmosphere above us. Um, we want to make sure that we have inclusive, safe, and resilient communities in Antarctica. So we've spent a lot of time doing user surveys to make sure that we build exactly what's needed. Um, Noppy's talked a lot about our zero emissions goals. We want Rothera to, to essentially not have any emissions by around 2030. Um, and there's a lot of work going into that um, to figure out how to balance that equation. Water is a really important one. There is no fresh water that we can get hold of readily in Rothera, despite the Antarctic being the largest source of fresh water in, on the planet. There's no lake, there's no stream, so we have to have a reverse osmosis plant to actually extract water from, um, from the sea. And obviously that means that we need to limit how much people can consume in a day. And that might mean we can't really afford to have people having hot showers for 20 minutes, and, and that gets very, very um, constrained. Um, we want our facilities to be resilient now and in the future, and with a change of climate, we don't know what that's going to look like. At the moment, we design for buildings that can operate down to minus 35 degrees, and um, the average is around 5 degrees in the summer. But we don't really know what Antarctica is going to be doing in 10, 20, 30 years' time in terms of its climate. There's some general trends that we can um, follow, much like the ones in the UK, where we, we know it's going to get hotter and wetter. And that, that does have an impact on how our buildings operate. So we, we are trying to look at that quite carefully at the moment. There's a couple of other things. Um, the carbon, always about the carbon. Um, so combating climate change, even though we're one research facility and our impact is fairly small, but we want to do our part. So every time we go through a work stage design, um, we follow a carbon standard called PAS 2080. And we're energy design as we can afford to do. Um, I've talked a little bit about interacting with the environment and the biodiversity that we have to manage out there, but the biosecurity is just as important, and we have one of the strictest regulations around biosecurity, so making sure that we don't bring any organism into Antarctica that doesn't belong there, and that can be anything from um, a rogue spider in a, in a container to fungus turning up on a pallet. Um, all of that needs decontaminating, and we have some really strict procedures in place for that. And finally, the supply chain. Our supply chain is obviously quite huge. We're a building site, so we can imagine all the different materials that come from all over the world and end up in Antarctica. Um, we want to make sure that all of that is as responsibly sourced as possible. So we're looking um, at both the amount of embodied carbon in the materials and seeing if we can increase the recycled content of it as well. And all of this strategy is aligned to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which we think is a really important way in terms of explaining and communicating what we're doing to, um, to other people. So finally, I'll just talk a little bit about the challenges. I mean, I've, I've covered a lot of them already, but in terms of trying to decarbonize a station, um, there's multiple things that interact and, and make it quite a complex thing to, to work out. So um, we need a reliable energy supply, um, and we're always going to need a backup system. We can't just rely on one boiler getting us through a winter. So um, having uh, multiple sources of energy is great, but that also means that you need multiple engineers to keep those systems going. The extreme weather, I think we all know about, um, but equally, we can't rely on one. So solar energy will get really good results for um, three months of the year, four months tops. Um, wind can be, uh, can be quite interesting in the fact that there's no wind turbine that can cope with some of the winds that we get in Antarctica. So how do we manage that? Um, wind turbines and birds don't really go together either, so we have to be really careful about um, where we site those wind turbines if that's what we end up choosing. And if we're going to decarbonise, we still haven't solved the aviation and shipping problem yet. As, as an industry, we, we don't know where that's going yet, and Noppy's hinted at some of the directions that's going to take. But there are some interesting people challenges as well. So um, it used to be that you could go down to Antarctica and you'd probably stay there for quite a long time. Um, and I've mentioned that some do stay up stay up to 18 months, but that's getting shorter and shorter, and uh, more people are visiting Antarctica for shorter amounts of time, so sometimes merely days. And there's a question around whether that's the right way to go. Every time somebody comes to Antarctica, there's a huge amount of carbon and energy and resource that goes into making sure that person is safe and comfortable, um, and you know, 
do, should, it, should it be right that somebody only comes for two, three days, or should they actually be staying for a little bit longer? Carbon equation. And I've talked a lot about the, the buildings, and they are fantastic. They're energy efficient. They're really comfortable places to work in, which is great. Um, you don't want to be stuck somewhere for 18 months being in minus 30 degree temperatures for a lot of it. But we have to also recognize that a larger building, uh, which is more complex, may well use more energy. So we're having to balance that quite carefully in terms of how does the whole site use energy and what is the best way to provide it. So just a few takeaways from today. Um, BAS is uh, aiming to be net zero by 2040. So whilst that is a solid 20 years away, that goes very, very quickly in terms of trying to figure out a renewable energy strategy for an entire organization. Rothera itself um, will be zero emissions. Um, we're aiming for 2030 for that. Um, renewable and smart energy systems are a big part of what's in our future. We do know that. Uh, we're just trying to figure out how much and, and when we can do it. And resilience in our buildings and our community is of the absolute utmost importance, along with protecting the Antarctic environment. So like Nokia said, it's a really, really big challenge, um, but our progress is looking quite promising. And um, thank you very much for listening, and it's time for questions. Okay, so does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? Yes, right in the middle here. Uh, the question was, have any of you actually been to Antarctica yourselves? Yes, I, I have been. I consider myself really lucky. I have been. Um, we have five stations. I've been to four of them. Yes. I've not been yet, but I've only been with BAS for a year. So it's my anniversary on Monday. <laughs> um, and in COVID, um, it has massively restricted the number of people who actually ca can go to um, Rothera. But um, the, the next uh, batch of people to go down there, including the construction crew, are all double vaxxed. And um, there's been a, a minimum of a, of a two week period so that they have the, uh, the immunization they need. And we do also have vaccines in Rothera now. Any other questions? Yes, right at the back. What materials do you use for your buildings? Uh, so the question was what materials do you use for your buildings? So it varies. Um, we've done quite a lot of feasibility to understand both what is the most appropriate and easy to construct material in Rothera. So we've done a modularization um, assessment study. Um, it boiled down to the two main options were a, a steel, um, steel structure um, versus a CLT structure, which is cross-laminated timber. So the Discovery Building, which is the one I pointed out at the beginning, the New Science and Operations Building, that's made out of a steel structure. It, it won out slightly in terms of ease of um, construction um, and ease of transport as well. But also CLT is, um, I, I know there's a lot of discussion around how timber is the way forward. Um, I don't think it's as clear cut as that. Timber is a renewable resource, which is great, but steel can be reused many, many, many times. Um, and the, the carbon equation around uh, using timber relies a lot on that timber not being put in a landfill afterwards and at the moment our infrastructure in the UK to deal with that timber isn't quite up to scratch. So at the moment we are sticking with steel but the next few projects that we're building such as um, in around eight years time we'll be looking at the accommodation block. Um, that's still, uh, the technology may have changed at, by that point so we may well be looking at more timber buildings in Antarctica by that point. to build buildings, so that was, that's what we used in the past a lot. Uh, yes, right to the front. Um, I'm wondering, have you looked at um, either successes or lessons learned from other Antarctic programs when kind of developing the plans? As uh, so the question was, uh, have you looked at the um, successes of other programs in order to be able to design your own? Yes. So we um, talk a lot to Antarctic, um, Antarctica New Zealand and the Australian Antarctic Division, um, who are also going through big redevelopment programs at the moment, um, which uh, Australia particularly is looking at building a, a large runway, for example, and the Scott base that the New Zealanders have is undergoing a massive, massive redevelopment. They're using some really interesting uh, modular builds, um, so they are... Uh, building it all in a port in uh, somewhere in New Zealand and allowing the public to actually go through and visit um, and then dismantling it and bringing it to uh, Antarctica and reassembling it again. And that's a really interesting way of building it. So 
when I talked about the digital build that we're doing um, for the discovery building. So at the moment, um, a lot of the building gets built first in a warehouse. It's not being done on the same scale as, say, the Scott base, but um, all of the boilers, for example, have been put together in a massive warehouse to make sure that we have um, an understanding of how long, it how long it takes, that we have all of the right um, products, that we have all of the right joins, um, all of the right fixings, and then it will get dismantled and palletized and put on a boat and sent down to um, Antarctica. So yeah, we, we do talk a lot, um, and there are there's a yearly um, meeting between all of the Antarctic operators to discuss problems and challenges just like that. Okay, uh, one last question then, yes. Ah, so the question is uh, very important. How would you dispose of your waste? Yeah. Brilliant question. <laughs> so we, we have signed the Antarctic Treaty, which basically uh, means that we do have to bring everything back to the UK. Um, there are some exceptions to that rule. Um, so sewage on uh, Rothera is dealt with through a sewage treatment plant, and we can, uh, we have, there's a small amount of incineration. Um, but all of the construction work, all of the demolition work that's going to have to happen um, is, um, yeah, we have to bring all of it back to the UK and Noppy and I are working to ensure that it's, you, it's disposed of in the best way possible. Um, and there's a lot of um, circularity being built into our waste at the moment. So rather than um, sending uh, concrete to be crushed and used as fill somewhere else, we're trying to see if we can salvage quite a lot of that and use it in a slightly higher value um, proposition. Sorry, Noppy, I should have let no, you speak a little bit more about that. Most importantly, I think we are trying to reduce waste as much as possible, so people are quite considerate. Um, if, if you uh, travel to Antarctic stations, you will really understand that. So people try to reduce waste as much as possible. Um, from food as well, um, this is really important. So you, you do get to have soups the next day based on the food that you had uh, the previous day. <laughs> That's a very good example of how we're trying to reduce that. Okay, uh, I'm afraid that's all the time that we have, sorry, for questions uh, this time. Uh, can we have one last thank you to uh, Nopi and Natalia? Thank you. So there are several more talks out through the rest of the day, so please do feel free to come back for those. Um, and don't forget to check out all of the exhibits up on the great map, uh, all sorts of fantastic things to have a look at there. Um, and I hope you have a good day for the rest of your day today. You're welcome to come in, uh, and find us at the, at the, at the stands and, have, and continue the discussion if there are more questions. We're hanging around here for a few more minutes if people do want to ask. Yeah.
Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the National Maritime Museum and to our Ice Worlds Festival uh, in partnership with the British Antarctic Survey. My name is Dr Greg Brown, I'm going to be your host for today's talk. Uh, just a quick message at the very beginning that uh, if uh, over the course of the last few days you unfortunately haven't been able to get onto one of our ticketed events for today, um, please uh, do take a look at the front of your, uh, your blue programmes. There's a QR code and some additional tickets have been opened up on some of those programs so if you would like to join them uh, please do look at those and see if you can join them now uh, we are having all sorts of different talks over the course of today fantastic talks from um, various different scientists uh, uh, involved with the British Antarctic Survey and uh, your talk uh, now is going to be from uh, Rob Larter um, he's the current uh, deputy science leader of paleo environments at the British Antarctic Survey and he's been working as a marine Marine geophysicist uh, with the survey since 1987. His research focuses on the history of ice sheets and glaciers in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. So please, uh, can we uh, welcome Rob Larter. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming along. I hope you're all enjoying Ice Worlds. So you've been introduced to me. I've been helped with the slides for this presentation by Martin Furlong and Matthew Palmer at the National Oceanography, who are an engineer and a physical oceanographer who've been involved in the development of the at Boat Face. Now, I've, I've been asked to make this talk suitable for 14-year-olds. This is a little bit of a challenge for me because my usual audience is other scientists. So I'm going to do my best, but cut me a little slack, please. And I can see there are a few uh, members of the audience who might not quite be 14. So my aim here today is exp to explain to you what is boating at Boat Face and why is it going to the Thwaites Glacier. So you may have, some of you may know a bit about the history of the name Boating at Boat Face. So let's put that to one side. Boating at Boat Face is now a, rob a robotic submersible uh, that was developed at the National Oceanography Centre that scientists can program and send off on missions to collect data that would traditionally only have been collected by research ships. Now, before I go into more about Boaty, I want to explain to you about where Thwaites Glacier is and why there is so much interest in it. So, question for the younger members of the audience. I need to, uh, Thwaites Glacier is in Antarctica. Which way do I need to go here? This is, a, this is a Google Earth view looking down on the UK. You think up? Anybody else? Everybody says up. Let's see. It's <laughs> the Earth is round. Yeah. No, we're going, we're going down. Going down the Atlantic Ocean, past Africa, past, past South America. And then if we keep going down, we get to a great white continent. So... This is where Thwaites Glacier is. The, the blue area there. And some, it's the other thing I want to... So why is there so much... It looks quite small relative to Antarctica. Why is there so much interest in it? Well, in the simple terms, the reason is the implications it might have for future sea level. But the one other thing I want to mention to you while we're here is it's incredibly remote. The nearest permanently occupied locations... Uh, the research stations operated by the British Antarctic Survey at Rothera on the Antarctic Peninsula and by the uh, US Antarctic Programme at McMurdo in the Ross Sea. And both of those are about 2,000 kilometres away. So putting people here takes a number of aircraft flights, or if you're going by ship, it takes a whole week to get there from South America. So how much... Another question for the young people. Of all the ice in the world... What proportion of it do you think is in Antarctica? 19. 19. Sounds a bit the same. Actually, 90% of all the ice in the world is in Antarctica. And if it was all instantaneously melted and put into the oceans, that would cause global sea level to rise by 58 metres. Don't panic. That's not going to happen in the lifetime of anybody here. It's not going to happen in the lifetime of the great, great, great grandchildren of anybody here. But it's a lot of ice. And we only, if, if an, even a small proportion of it ends up in the ocean, that can result in a sea level rise, which is going to 
cause major problems worldwide. So the map I've got here, based on satellite data, is showing us how the Antarctic ice sheet has been changing since the early years of this century. So the, the blue areas have been gaining a little bit of ice. The surface of the ice is getting a little bit higher. Uh, the orange areas are losing ice, and the red and even the purple areas are losing a lot of ice. So there's the outline of Thwaites Glacier in that light blue area. You can see that this is in the center of, area, center, center of an area that's losing quite a lot of ice. And I said about it appearing to be small relative to Antarctica. It is actually huge. This isn't like a glacier you might go and look at in the Alps. This is a glacier the size of a country, a country like the UK at the same scale. Really, the area is about the same as the main island of Great Britain. So one more thing I want to say about Antarctica here. We talk about the Antarctic ice sheet, but often scientists, we regard it as two ice sheets. The East Antarctic Ice Sheet, outlined in orange here, E-A-I-S, and that is mostly sitting on rock above sea level. We're less concerned about that. The area that is the real source of concern for future sea level rise is the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, W-A-I-S, WACE, outlined in red there. And you can see that most of, most of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet has been losing ice over recent years. Uh, so... This is, this is the area we're concerned about. Um, so why, is, why are we concerned about the West Antarctic ice sheet? Well, the reason is essentially that most of it sits on a bed that is below sea level. And some parts of that bed go very deep. As you go up glacier, back up flow, it gets deeper and deeper to more than two kilometers of below sea level in the interior. And particularly the Thwaites Glacier drainage basin Virtually all of that is below sea level. So the blue, this is the bed, this is a map of the bed of the Antarctic ice sheet, the depths of the bed. All the blue areas are below sea level. The yellow and red, orange are above sea level. And the deep blue is a long way below sea level. So a long time ago, decades ago, glaciologists thought about this sort of configuration of a glacier. And they realized there's a potential instability there that once... If a retreat starts on a glacier whose bed gets deeper upstream, uh, this could start to run away. It, 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 could be, it could be a runaway retreat. And now the reason for this, it, I've got a slide that I can explain this on here. Don't be scared. This is the most complicated slide, so pay attention, but don't be scared. It's got scary mathematical symbols on it. We won't go into any mathematics. Don't worry about that. So if a glacier is on a bed below sea level, at some point the downstream end is going to go afloat, and we call that bit an, an ice shelf. And that is, of course, floating. So by Archimedes' principle, it's already displacing its own weight in water. We can consider that already lost to the ice sheet. It's, so it's already part of the ocean. So the gateway between the, the ice in the ice sheet and the ocean is this point where it goes afloat, the grounding line. And... What you can see here is if that grounding line, for any reason, retreats a little bit, the, the ice passing through it, the gateway has become wider. So even if it's flowing at the same rate, you're, put, you're transferring more ice from the ice sheet to the ocean. Another thing you're doing, which I'll come to later, is you're exposing a greater thickness of the ice to the water. And if the water's warm, that becomes a real problem. So... Now let's come to Thwaites Glacier. This is the front of Thwaites Glacier in a satellite image. And it's just like those conceptual, that conceptual section I showed you. The end of it is, ends up as floating ice, these ice shelf areas. We, there are two areas, one which we call the, the eastern ice shelf, one which we call the Glacier Tongue. And uh, that's a satellite image from two years ago. And coincidentally, just a couple of days before that satellite image was collected, I took this photo from a research ship right at the front. That's what it looks like, kind of on the ground or on the sea, if you're on a, on, on a research ship. We weren't playing, actually. We were collect I mean, this wasn't a tourist trip. We were collecting data as we went along the front of this. What we were doing was mapping the ocean floor, seeing how deep it was there. So ice shelves are actually an incredibly important part of, of, of the ice sheet, but they're incredibly fragile as well. Over the past 30 years, there have been a number of instances where 
ice shelves, it's fair to say what, what's happened to them, they've collapsed. Um, the best recorded one of these, the best documented, is the collapse of the Larsen B ice shelf, which is, was on the east side of the Antarctic Peninsula, which just completely uh, collapsed in just a couple of months in early 2002. So this is a satellite image showing what the ice shelf looked like at the end of January 2002, and what I'll show you now is a GIF that cycles through a set of satellite images collected over the next two months. It'll go back. That's the beginning, and that's how it finished up. And, and it, it's just like the ice, sheet, the ice shelf just totally exploded in, 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 two, in a couple of months. And while this may be, seem quite alarming, the really significant thing that was, that was discovered when this happened is from looking at what happened to the glaciers that had been feeding into that ice shelf... Uh, before, af after it collapsed. Over the next year, the, f their f the flow rates on those glaciers increased quite significantly. So they were putting more ice into the ocean, making a bigger contribution to sea level ch change. So this shows an important role in holding back glaciers and restricting their rate of flow. So what about Thwaites Glacier ice shelves? Well, you know where Thwaites Glacier is now. All the ice, the ice shelves shown in yellow here are pretty fine at the moment. The ones in orange and red are losing a thinning. They're, they're losing a lot of ice. And you can see all the ice shelves in the region around Thwaites Glacier are thinning quite rapidly. And we know the reason for that. It's not, it's not surface melting. This is an important point to understand. Even today... The temperatures don't get warm enough where Thwaites Glacier is for significant surface melting to happen. What's happening is it's warm water that's originating from the deep ocean that's coming against the front of the glacier that's causing the melting. And this, this map shows you the temperatures of the water at the seabed all around Antarctica. Where, where there's a blue shading, the water at the seabed is, is quite cold. It's not really going to cause much melting. Uh, where... There's a pink shading, that's where you've got relatively warm water at the seabed. So if we look at this in a, in a section, along that purple line, this is a section through the ocean approaching Thwaites Glacier. Well, in fact, it's a f approaching the neighbour of, of Thwaites Glacier, Pine Island Glacier. So it goes from the, the deep ocean on the left to Pine Island Glacier on the right. The, the black is the shape of the seafloor. The, the blue colours are the cold surface water, and the red colours, red and orange colours, are the relatively warm water coming from the deep ocean. Now, you'd normally expect warm water to sit on top of cold water, but the warm water here, this water out here is saltier, which makes it denser. So the warm water actually is mostly below about 400 metres water depth. So where it comes into contact with the ice, it goes into the cavities underneath the floating bit of the ice and it melts these ice shelves from below, not from right from the front, but from below. So this is all, hap all this, this, everything that's happening there is quite hidden. Uh, and by the way, we're not talking about warm water that you'd want to take a bath in here. These are the, these are the temperatures relative to the in situ uh, freezing melting point of ice. So three, about three degrees above the temperature that, that you, would, you would freeze at. So you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to even dip your toes in it, really. Uh, but that's a lot of heat energy for melting ice. So what's going on on the Thwaites ice shelf over just the last few years? Well, this is really hot off the press satellite data. Um, so because, because the ice shelf is floating, if you look with a satellite at how the surface elevation of that ice shelf is, is changing, you can work out what the thickness of the ice is. So on the left, we have a map that's showing us how the surface of the ice shelf is changing. And everywhere that's pink and red has been going down just over the last three years. And from that, you can calculate how much, it, how much it's thinning, how much it's melting at the base. And so, again, over here, everything that's pink and red, it's melting a lot at the base. The dark red, it's losing 20 metres of ice every year. So, you know, probably these ice shelves are not going to last very long. I've seen scientists making projections of this. These ice shelves are probably going to disappear in a decade, maybe a bit longer if we're lucky. And then we'll see what happens to Thwaites last year. So, but what the important point here 
is that what's going on is in this hidden world under these ice shelves. We need to, fi we need to find out how, war where and how warm water is accessing these spaces, where it's going when it gets under there, where it makes contact with the base of the ice, if we're going to really accurately predict what's going to happen in the future. So this is where Boaty McBoatface comes in. So, but before I show you some pictures more, tell you more about Boaty McBoatface, just some pictures of the general environment. This is the research ship that went, the, the, the uh, B. Palmer, that I went there on in 2019 and 2020. That's not actually the ice shelf. That's big tabular icebergs in the background that have broken off the ice shelf. This is from the British Antarctic Survey's geophysical survey aircraft, a twin otter, that flew detailed airborne geophysical surveys over the front of Foyt's Glacier a few years ago. And that's a photo taken out the window looking, at, looking southwards towards the ice shelf. That's what it looks like. More specifically, this is the kind of environment that, we'll, that Boaty will be deployed in, just at the front of the ice shelf. These are a couple of photos I took two years ago, right along the front of the ice shelf. And very conveniently, a seal agreed to sit there for me on an ice floes for scale. That's a seal. So that's an idea of, of this kind of scale that you're looking at. But also remember that nine-tenths of, of floating ice is below water. So... When, you when Boaty is deployed in this environment, before it can go into this cavity, it's going to have to dive down 300 or 400 metres. So, coming to Boaty McBoatface, that's what it looks like. It's a kind of yellow torpedo-shaped object about three metres long. And this is what the Boaties look like when you take the lid off them. And... I'm giving the game away here. There's not just one boaty, there's, there's a family of them. There's at least six, because there are three of the type at the back there and three of the type at the front. And these are the two main types. One is designed for maximum endurance. It can go out and do missions up to 6,000 kilometres long before it comes back and wants to be picked up. Another, one is another type is designed for being able to dive really deep, 6,000 metres. Um, what you're seeing here mainly is the pressure vessels inside. And the pressure vessels actually have all the important bits in, all the electronics and all the, um, the batteries. And the point there is that anything that you, you're putting for sub to submerge in the ocean, you need to protect delicate electronics from the seawater and you need to prevent it from being crushed by the immense pressures it's going to uh, be subjected to. Now, the boaties don't just carry one fixed set of scientific instruments. They're, they're flexible platforms that you could put a range of instruments on, but generally they will have sensors that will record the, the basic parameters about the ocean. They will record the temperature and the salinity and the dissolved oxygen content, but you, could, you can put things like cameras and sonar systems on these as well. And that, that brings us to boat is, if you're going to send a boaty under an ice shelf, you've got a particular issue that boaty needs to be able to make sure it doesn't crash into things. And the bottom of an ice shelf is much rougher than the top. And also, generally, we know very little about the, the shape of the seafloor under an ice shelf because we, you know, we can't survey that very easily. So a boaty that's going to go under an ice shelf needs to be smart. It needs to be able to sense its environment. So... A lot of effort has gone into developing something called an, an obstacle avoidance system, OAS, here. So these images show you the stages in development of an obstacle avoidance system. So what the, 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 the smart engineers at National Oceanography Centre have done is they've taken a sonar system that sends out pulses of sounds and listens to the, echo, the echoes, put that on the front of the, uh, the auto sub long range of the boaty, so it's sending pulses of sound forwards and listening for echoes, like, like a dolphin navigates underwater or like a bat navigates in the, in, the, in the dark, in the air. So these are the stages. I mean, when you're designing any complex engineering system, you start with a computer-aided design model, and then you try and build it, and then you put it in an experimental tank to test it, and then when you think it's ready, you take it to a bit of the natural environment. And earlier this year, they took... The, uh, this boaty to Loch Ness, which is the second deepest loch in Scotland, to, to see how it would perform. And then in the bottom right here, we've got a sort of uh, visualisation of what that's going to look like when boaties operating under the ice shelf. 
So that's where we are. Um, I mean, is it going to work? Well, we're going to find out very shortly because right now the boaty that's been modified in this way is on its way to a port in South America to go on another cruise on the Nathaniel B. Palmer this season. And January and February, it's, the expedition's going to be at Thwaites Glacier and they're going to try and send one of these boaties under the Thwaites Glacier and hopefully it's going to come back with a lot of uh, important information that we can use to work out what's going to happen there and how much that glacier is going to contribute to sea level rise in the future. So that's what I have at the moment. These are the points that I would like, I hope you've taken away from what I sa I've said, that future change in the West Antarctic ice sheet is the largest uncertainty in projecting future sea level rise this century. Thwaites Glacier is the most vulnerable and the most rapidly retreating glacier in Antarctica, and there's good reasons to expect that retreat to accelerate. And when, if Thwaites Glacier retreats, that will increase the vulnerability of neighboring glaciers. Ice, ice shelves, which are floating extensions of glaciers over the sea, they act to, as a break on glacier flow, but they're incredibly fragile. And the reason Thwaites Glacier is is losing ice, is warm water that's impinging on it from the deep ocean. So we've got Boatie McBoat Face now, or Autosub Long Range, as the engineers who built it tend to refer to it as. It's been adapted to go under the ice shells and find out exactly what's going on in those hidden worlds. And we're going to find out how well that goes over the next few months. I expect this expedition will make the news. You will, if you're, if you're searching for it on Google, you'll find stuff out about it. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, a fascinating talk there. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, right to the front here. Uh, so the, the sorry. So the question was um, uh, in the uh, in both in both face. So uh, where do the sensors sit inside the? Uh, well, different sensors will sit in different places. I think your 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 question is how do you get the information back? Exactly. Yes. So the information is almost all recorded internally. Okay. You have to recover the submersible and then you download the data. Okay. So yeah, there's a jeopardy in the very long missions. You could collect a lot of data, and if you don't get the instrument, if you don't get the submersible back, you've not only lost a lot of money, you haven't got the data. <laughs> uh, yeah, question right to the front. Um, how far down are the glaciers? Uh, how far down are the glaciers? How far down? Yeah, how fragile? How fragile? Well, fragile, I do apologise. Well, I mean, the, the illustration is that ice shelf. Uh, the, there's been a number of those kind of ice shelf collapses over the last 30 years. The, the last B1 is kind of the poster child because we have great satellite images of it. And you can see that, that a whole ice shelf that uh, was tens of kilometers across just fragmented in, in the space of a couple of months. Um, and that's happened several times. So the glaciers themselves are a bit more robust. But over the last 10 years, apart from the marine instability a hypothesis I tried to explain. There's also something called the marine ice cliff instability that people have highlighted, that if you take away an ice shelf and leave a cliff that's very tall, um, the, the weight of the ice itself could exceed the strength of the ice, and then you could start getting an even faster sort of retreat. Uh, uh, I mean, this is the sort of principle when people are building tall buildings, they have to know the strength of the material, because if you build a tall building too tall, you're gonna, you, the concrete's going to st start to fail. Uh, yes, right to the front. Yes, uh, I've got two questions. So the first question is, uh, is there anyone uh, at the moment steering and controlling this boat? No, it's, it's, to it's totally... Or so the, the, the submersible, the, the boaties are totally autonomous and, the, and their predecessors. Um, so it's, it's entirely, it's, it's, a mission is programmed, and obviously with the, the obstacle avoidance system, it needs to have some level of artificial intelligence. So if it meets an obstacle, it has to work out how to avoid it while deviating as little as possible from, it, from its mission. It's all battery powered, and um, at the moment, I'm afraid. Uh, okay, I'll come clean here. 
or I'll come dirty, um, they are disposable batteries that are used at the moment because sim quite simply disposable batteries pack more, more energy density. The people at uh, the engineers at NSC are experimenting with various rechargeable battery solutions at the moment, and they hope to implement those in the not too distant future. Uh, yes, at the back there. Um, I was wondering if you know the source of that yielded water and why it focused on that part of the West Coast. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if that's so, the question is what is the source of that warm water, and why is it focused on the point that it is? That's a very good question, and that's what a lot of research is geared to finding the answer to. We, we think there is a, a hypothesis, and we think, we think this is true. We couldn't like, put our hand on our heart sorry, and say, this is 100%, we're 100% sure of this. But it seems to be, uh, during the 20th century, probably related to warming of the, ocean, the Pacific Ocean, there have been changes in wind patterns. And most of the Southern Ocean circulation is actually driven, but is wind-driven. The most of the water in the Southern Ocean travels eastwards continuously around Antarctica, driven by winds coming from the west. Uh, we think that in the, we think because we don't have instrumental records that go back that far, um, this is one of the things that I'm engaged in. We're looking at natural archives to, to check this, uh, sediment cores, ice cores. Um, we think the wind patterns along the Antarctic continental margin in this part of Antarctica changed in the middle of the 20th century, resulting in warm water being driven onto the shelf. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, does anyone think about you know ideas of carbon spots? Obviously, it'd be great if the cooler water was somehow lower down. But do you think it also acts, I don't know, very strong sort of across the, the border of the the sea? Just so we get this, this temperature to. I mean, these these are kind of geoengineering solutions. Yeah, there there are a lot of sort of ideas out there. In general, when you start to examine them in detail, the the, the efforts, the, the resources that would be involved in implementing any, even if it works, would be immense. Uh, I mean, the, the remoteness of this area is, is the problem. You know, it's, it's anything big you want to get in there, you're going to have to transport by ship. It takes a week by ship. The, the carbon emissions of, of a, uh, going there on a ship and back, two weeks traveling on a ship, or, and a lot of ships, are enormous. And then en most geoengineering solutions, the problem is, the Earth's climate system is complex, and when you poke a complex system, you often get unexpected, you know, it, it, there are unexpected things that can happen. So any kind of geoengineering solution, you need to be very sure you, you've really checked it out. So we, could, we could trigger things that we, we really don't want to. The, the best solution is, like, <laughs> let's stop changing the climate. <laughs> Yeah, right at the very front. How do you make sure they're waterproof? How do you make sure they're waterproof? Well, in the development of, of the boaties, they will have done lots of tests in, in experimental water tanks, big swimming pools, effectively. And they'll monitor that to see if, if any water is getting in. Uh, I mean, if water does get in, you'll, you'll know quite soon because the electronics will start failing. And particularly with, uh, with lithium batteries, that's, that's not good. Um, yeah, I mean, it's trial and error, really. Uh, you'll have checked this out in, in experimental tanks before you put these things into the natural environment. And we'll have one last question here. Uh, is there anything to do with the El Nino uh, current? Uh, so is the El Nino current, the warm water that goes round? Yeah, um, that's a, a, a field of scientific interest, is how are things that happen near Antarctica correlated with the El Niño-La Niña cycle? There is a degree of correlation, and indeed, um, the amount of warm water that's coming onto the Antarctic shelf does seem to be... It correlates with the intensity of the El Niños, or a lot of people think it does. And indeed, it's been suggested there were some very strong El Niños in the 1940s, and we think that may have been when the, uh, the first strong pulses of warm water started coming onto the Antarctic shelf. There's some evidence that my colleagues have, some of my colleagues have uh, found for that from sediment cores on the seafloor. We can see that some things changed dramatically around about the 1940s. Okay, if we can uh, thank then uh, Rob Latter one, one, one more time.
Thank you very much. And uh, you do uh, have a look at the rest of the uh, attractions and activities happening over the course of the rest of today. There will be more talks throughout the rest of the day. And don't forget to look up on the great map for all of the exhibits that are up there. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.
just waiting for the thumbs up, guys. I think we'll be... No, <laughs> we'll be doing one more minute. I think that's a thumbs up. <laughs> Okay. Hello, hello. I'm going to proceed as if it was a thumbs up. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to the Ice World Festival. Welcome specifically to the, uh, uh, the talks that we're doing. Um, uh, my name is Ed. Uh, you don't have to worry about me. I'm actually an astronomer, so I am going to be listening in uh, just as intently as you are, I'm sure. Uh, but I'm, I'm hosting things uh, for today and it's going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll be meeting our speakers in just a second. But before we do that, there's just one or two uh, little things. Uh, first of all, we're also going, uh, we're being sort of broadcast to YouTube and we're also going out to various screens across the site. Uh, so as well as the talk, we're also going to do a bit of a Q&A session. And uh, in that, don't worry, I'm going to come around with the mic and I will repeat your question. You don't have to shout, you don't have to try and project or anything like that. I'm going to, whatever you do, I'm going to repeat the question anyway because I want to make sure it's picked up uh, by everybody. So that's, that's one thing. It's a bit of a sort of unnatural uh, rhythm, but I will get through it, I'm sure. Uh, the other thing is, um, this might seem slightly off topic, uh, uh, if you want to take part in the Penguin Parade, that's happening at four. So if you want to dress up like a penguin, uh, this is the ability to do that, um, or you might have your own costume anyway, I, I'm not here to judge, uh, but at four o'clock they're all going to march over uh, and uh, the captain is actually going to honk the horn of the ship. I don't know if you call it a horn on a ship, but you know, that, that's all happening So that, uh, at four, so I, I just uh, want to mention that. And, and as well as that, if perhaps you've just come to one of these lectures but you haven't seen the exhibits, I do want to encourage you to go and take a look at the uh, BAS uh, exhibits that are on the Great Map and indeed in the learning spaces uh, across the site because uh, there's some amazing stuff. Um, however, I won't take up too much more of your time. Uh, I'm going to introduce, introduce our speakers. I, I'm going to read it because I, I want to make sure I get it right. We have two PhD students with us uh, with the British Antarctic Survey. We've got uh, Dorothy Moser and uh, Bryony Freer. Uh, and they are going to be talking about uh, their efforts, their work, uh, to understand the past, present and future of climate change in Antarctica. And they're going to be explaining uh, the different tools uh, that they use uh, unlocking stories from the ice itself. Uh, so if you can give them a big round of applause and then we'll uh, jump into it. Thank you very much and yes, welcome to our talk. Um, I hope you've been enjoying your time at the Ice Worlds Festival. And we're really excited today to be speaking to you about all of our work um, as glaciologists at the British Antarctic Survey. Um, I mainly study um, the ice from satellites, so that's me over there on the left, and I'm Dorothea, and I study ice cores to reconstruct the climate of the past. Um, and maybe to start with, it's good to have a short reminder, what are we dealing with? Uh, so what are the Arctic and the Antarctic? The Arctic is where the bear is. That's the literal meaning of it. But in general, the polar regions are near the North and the South Pole. And while the Arctic is the region of an ocean surrounded by several continents, uh, and it's covered by sea ice. It's the opposite way around for the Antarctic. It's a continent covered by ice and then surrounded by the Southern Ocean. And the two of us are dealing with the Antarctic. The special thing about it is that it's the highest, the coldest, the driest, and the windiest continent of this Earth. It's a special place to work in, and it's incredibly important, and that's something uh, Brian is going to mention to us now. Yes, so um, the Antarctic holds the largest ice sheet in the world, and along with all of the ice shelves that fringe the continent and the sea ice, that covers 28 million square kilometres of ice, which is pretty huge. And if that was to all melt, um, which warming, warming temperatures from climate change is kind of threatening, um, it could raise global sea levels by up to 58 metres, which is like 22 flights of stairs. Um, and if we move on to the next slide. And so how would this affect us here in London? Um, I hope you recognise the Thames and the red, the red pointer shows where we are here in Greenwich. And with data modelled by NASA, we can have a look at how different rates of sea level rise would kind of affect, um, affect us here. So this is showing with two metres of sea level rise, which is one of the upper predictions that we could reach by the end of this century, according to the IPCC. And we see a lot of um, kind of extra flooding along the banks of the Thames and in other small pockets of London, um, which is it's really um, highly populated, obviously, would cause lots of problems. Um, if we move to five metres, we're getting a lot more inundation. Um, and 10 metres, again, London essentially becomes a river. 
Um, Greenwich, though, seems to still be okay. But when we go, when we go to 60 meters, um, this is London's gone basically, um, and and this isn't going to happen in our lifetimes um, or even kind of thousands of years. But it just to give an idea of the scale of the amount of ice that's down in Antarctica, and this is why we're really interested in studying it, so we can better predict um, kind of how quickly sea levels are going to rise around the world. So this is sea level, but why am I interested in ice of Antarctica? First of all, it all started with snowflakes, at least for me personally. If you have a look at these images, in my opinion, snowflakes are incredibly beautiful. And they're not just beautiful, they're unique. If we were considered a, my favorite fact about snowflakes, every single snowflake in the entire universe is unique. And that's quite mind-blowing, especially when you're in an environment like this fully glacierized, covered by snowflakes, and thinking about not only the beauty and their uniqueness, but also their informational value. Because each snowflake carries information about the environment in which it was uh, developed and where it falls. And that's what I'm interested in as an ice core scientist. We need the layers of those snowflakes, and we're drilling into glacierized surfaces, retrieving records, ice cores from those sites and their environmental history. So how does that actually work? First of all, we have to get into the field. And that's either with our new ship, Sir David Attenborough, that's currently here in London, or using airplanes, or being deployed from the heli deck by a helicopter to our smaller sites on the islands. But then we're staying in the field. And that's where we're confronted with the forces of nature either in a tent or in a station like Halley. And that's where we carry out our field work then. We're gonna, uh, you're gonna be able to see some of that equipment in the exhibition, so check that out. But when we then drill an ice core, what does that actually look like? I've got a short video for you, and we're gonna observe the drill go down the borehole. What's a drill? It's an empty barrel a masterpiece of engineering, to be honest, and it's let down on a long wire to retrieve ice core samples by grinding its way downward and holding it with some sharp knives into, in that barrel. So it takes a lot of patience letting that barrel down into the hole. The deeper we get, the more time it takes. And then we bring it back up when the barrel is filled with ice. So we're opening the chasm waiting for it to return, handling it carefully because these, both these devices and the samples are rare and expensive. And then, this is the drilling tent from outside. We lower the drill head so that we can empty the barrel. And then we pull it to the side, decontaminate the rim, remove ice chips that have accumulated outside during the drilling process and push out the sample really carefully. The most important rule in high school science is never confuse top and bottom, <laughs> because that's going to mess up your entire story. <laughs> <laughs> and when we're done with that, we're putting it all in boxes and bring it back to the lab, because that's where the analyses are made. So in the lab, it's not any lab, it's at minus 25 because otherwise, our samples would melt away. And we've got various analyses, anything from structural measurements to chemical measurements. I like the variety of measurements and approaches that we can um, apply to ice cores very personally. And when, then we've got the ice. What information can we extract from it? First of all, there's the ice itself. You can see a, an X-ray scan of it right here. And you can see some layers. We can see that as a record of snowfall events, individual storms maybe, and they are distinct in their appearance. We've got a record of that. And the composition of the snow itself is also um, an indicator of past air temperatures. Then we've got impurities. It's not purely water, but everything it picks up on its way to Antarctica, we're gonna see that in our record. And that can be anything from volcanic ash, to pollen, 
And that's going to be an indicator of maybe atmospheric circulation. Where did the winds come from? What did it pick up? And also chemical impurities can be a tracer of the sea ice extent and its variability around Antarctica. Last but not least, there's the air of ice cores. And that's maybe the specialty because it's direct evidence of the atmospheric composition of the past. You're welcome to have a look at that at the ice core stand in the exhibition above. Um, but in my opinion, that's the, the best part. And it's uh, very unique because other records of the environment don't have that direct evidence. By combining all these different aspects of ice cores, we are able to reconstruct the climate of the past. And that is possible over the last 800,000 years. So that's a long history. And that is actually what puts our current observations of CO2 level in context. Over the last 800,000 years, CO2 levels in ice cores and in our atmosphere have never been above 300 ppm. Now, we're faced with more than 400. That's a lot. Now, to give you an impression of what melting causes to ice, you can see air bubbles pop in from these ice core samples. And while it might be beautiful to look at right here, melting is an issue for ice cores. And that's something I personally am working with. Which information are still recorded in these ice cores? That's a question that needs to be resolved for ice core science in a warming climate. So I'm using these more bubble-free layers when the ice core has molten and refrozen in a certain section and try to reconstruct what it can actually be used for. And now we're going to um, transition to a bit more of a remote approach to studying Antarctica. Do you want to give us a thing? Yes. Thank you. So yes, while Dorothea studies ice cores to reconstruct the past climate, I take a slightly different approach in my research to the, of the ice sheets. So I use um, this network of Earth observation satellites that we have um, that orbit our planet every day. Um, there are over 650 Earth observation satellites currently in orbit, and they all kind of measure different things with different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And um, some of them kind of work like a giant camera, taking pictures like you see on Google Earth. Um, others have more specialized instruments on board that transmit kind of radar or lasers down to Earth and measure what bounces back. And um, from this, we can, we can measure a whole range of properties of the ice sheets. And this, this has kind of revolutionized polar science because um, it means that we can collect data over the whole continental scale without having to go directly in the field necessarily, which is you know, a very expensive, it's a very inaccessible place, and uh, not to mention very cold. So I'm just going to show a couple of the, the cool applications of satellite data to the ice sheets today. So firstly, was Dorothea was talking about melting layers in her ice cores, um, and obviously this happens when temperatures get above zero degrees consistently. Um, and we can see with satellites what this melt looks like on the surface of the ice in real time. So this picture here shows an example of kind of these surface lakes that pooled on the George VI ice shelf um, in Antarctica. And, and this is taken from a plane. So we can see them really clearly here, but obviously it's really um, kind of inefficient to send a plane around the whole of Antarctica. It's, it's far too large to do that. So we can turn to um, satellites like the European Space Agency's Sentinel-2 to get a kind of bigger picture. And this is the sort of images we get, we get from the satellite. Now this is an image from the same ice shelf as before, um, and it was taken on a, on a day in January 2020, so just before COVID struck. And um, it, it was on a 32-year record melt event. And you can see the so it's really extensive formation of these, of these ponds all over the ice shelf. And just for an idea of scale, this is about 30 by 30 kilometers. So each of these, these bigger lakes that you see here are uh, five kilometers wide each, which is, just gives an idea of the scale of these features and why satellites is really important to be able to kind of measure them on this scale. And, and surface meltwater um, production is, is predicted to double by 2050 in Antarctica. And so it's going to start happening in regions that we never expected it to or that we never thought really got above, one, above zero degrees. Um, and so satellites are going to be really critical in tracking this. Um, so other than showing that the temperature is rising, another reason why we're really interested in these melt features is that they've been linked to the breakup of ice shelves 
which are these really dynamically important regions of ice that fringe the continent. And they kind of act as giant buttresses to hold back the flow of glaciers from inland into the ocean. Um, and so this process has kind of dramatically caused a um, breakup of an ice shelf um, in Larsen B in 2002. And I'm just going to play a time lapse of satellite images that we saw. And the scientists were kind of looked in amazement at these images as the entire ice shelf collapsed over the course of a single month. And this is 3,000 square kilometers of ice. So that's about double the size of Greater London, all just gone in, in the course of a single month. And, and this, this followed a series of kind of warmer summers, um, especially the 2002 summer was exceptionally warm. And it caused all this melt that you can see in the first images that appear, those blue, the blue dots, all these melt ponds. And they kind of acted as giant wedges where they like deepened the crevasse, the crevasses and kind of splintered the, the ice shelf apart. Um, and this, the ice that's lost as icebergs into the ocean, this isn't directly contributing to sea level rise. But what scientists could kind of measure with satellites was that these, these glaciers, all to the left of the image, that are flowing into the ice shelf, suddenly sped up dramatically after this ice shelf collapsed, um, up to 300% speed ups. And this, it increased the total mass of ice that was being lost into the ocean every year from about four gigatons per year before this collapse to 40 gigatons per year after. So that's so much more ice that's being lost into the ocean and contributing to sea level rise. And now some of the ways that we measure this changing ice speed um, we essentially can take repeated images over the same area and then track certain features like surface debris or big crevasses and see how much it's moved between images so we can work out the speed. Um, but with, with a lot of satellite data, the optical data, like in the previous images, if there's ever any clouds, which happens a lot in Antarctica, or um, during the winter where it's 24 hours of darkness, you, you can't see anything. So we turn to these radar satellites which use longer wavelengths, they can see through clouds and they don't need the sun to be there. Um, and it allows us to measure how fast the ice is flowing all around Antarctica. And so this is a little time-lapse animation of radar images we get over Pine Island Glacier. And you can see the ice traveling like a giant river to the ocean where it's carving off these big icebergs. Um, and this glacier in particular was found to have sped up by 42% since the 90s, um, which is quite tremendous, and it's draining a lot of the ice sheet, um, so this is quite worrying. But um, if we're to kind of fully understand the relationship between ice loss and sea level rise, we don't just need to know how fast the ice is moving, but also how thick the ice there is. And so we turn to another range of satellites um, called altimeters, and one of these is ISAT-2, which is shown here, and it's what I am lucky enough to use in my research. And it essentially sends down lasers to Earth and um, measures how fast it takes for the individual laser pulses to go from the satellite down to Earth and back again. Um, and we can measure the, from this the Earth elevation of the ice to within four millimeters, which I think is pretty spectacular considering this satellite is, is flying around the Earth over 480 kilometers above us. Um, and so, if we can do this over the continental scale, over a lot, a lot, many, many years, we can start to see where, where the ice is thinning or thickening and produce kind of maps like this. So this is showing mass loss from Antarctica between 2003 and 2019. All the red areas are where we're losing a lot of mass, mainly caused by warming oceans and ice shelf collapse. Um, and there are lots of areas in blue where it's a slight thickening, but it's actually a short-term effect because there's been increased precipitation as a result of many factors to do with climate change. Um, and this is really, really critical information for us to be able to um, predict the future mass loss that we're going to see and how quickly it's going to contribute to sea level rise in the future. So, yes, satellites have... I have hoped have shown can kind of give us the whole three-dimensional picture of ice in Antarctica. So it covers the whole spatial area and also gives us that third dimension of thickness. But when it comes to the fourth dimension of time, we're a little bit, we're a little bit limited because we only have satellites going back to about 40 or 50 years ago. So this is where we kind of turn to ice cores um, and to kind of put these changes, present day changes that we're seeing with satellites in the context of longer, longer climate history. And so it just kind of highlights how complementary these two different approaches are to studying the um, Antarctic ice sheet. 
And to wrap it off, we're on the eve of COP26. Um, I hope we've shown you that what happens in Antarctica is not somewhere happening remotely, but that is all connected. And that is quite interesting to work on this subject. But if we see the future of the Antarctic ice sheet, and we see our choice between high emissions and low emissions, and we see our politicians making decisions about our future, it's important to know that it's our choice how the future of Antarctica and of our planet is going to um, develop. And while our politicians may be discussing, we can't negotiate with a melting point of ice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, folks, we do have just a few minutes uh, uh, for some questions, if you have any. Um, don't be shy. But remember, I'm going to come around and I will, I will repeat anything you have to say. Uh, bear with me. That's a good question. What's the deepest ice core that you've drilled out? So, you may all have a guess, but it's several kilometres. So more than three and a half, if I am not mistaken, but that's my best guess. Maybe you can go back to the slide that we had. Um, so yeah, the ice thickness is more than four kilometers, but our oldest records, or our deepest records, are more than three and a half over there, and maybe close to four on that slide, so for Vostok and the um, Way Waste Divide. Maybe a bit confusing, wouldn't it? Yeah. Can, sorry, can I just? I'm just going to repeat just for for everybody on the screens. Uh, so, uh, the there doesn't seem to be a correlation necessarily between the the depth of the ice and the age of the samples. So, are different depths, different ages in different locations. Yeah. So, of course, the age is not only depending on the depth, but it depends on how much snow is falling per year, because the more snow that uh, is falling during one year the thicker the annual layer, and the fewer years you're going to have in one meter of ice at the surface. So there's a compression with age and with burial if new years are layered on top of each other. But if there's a site on the coast that experiences a lot of accumulation, the resolution of the ice core will be higher because the annual layers are thicker, but it's not going to go that far in, t in time. While an ice core that has very thin annual layers bit less of a resolution per year, we might go back further in time. And another factor that plays a role is, of course, the flow of the ice sheet. If um, at a certain point the ice is flowing, it might, or it's melting at the bottom, we might lose something of that oldest ice at the bottom. Currently, there's a project called Oldest Ice, and it's aiming for an ice core that covers more than a million years. So that's a bit of that context. Um, and they're especially interested in exactly what you asked. Where do we find the best resolution, but also where do we find that oldest ice? Oh, we do have one down the front. Yeah. Do you store the cores? Do you store all of the cores once you've finished? It's quite a bit of work, and it takes a lot of storage. Yes, we do store the cores. Um, we cut them in pieces, and parts of them are melted when we've dealt with them. But we try to keep an archive of every site that we have so that we can maybe re-measure certain sections in the future when measurement approaches have changed or improved. And we've got several kilometers of ice stored in large freezers at minus 40 around the world. So all our collaborators um, are joining forces to keep such a large storage archive of ice cores, yeah. We've got a few more. Um, I'm going to go up to the back, and then don't worry, I'll come back for more.
I'm going to try and pass that, I think. Um, so so it's, a, it's about whether, you know, we're taking multiple samples, but you might observe something in one sample, but not in another. Yeah. And so when you're studying them, because you can only study a limited number, yeah. is, is there a danger there that you're missing something? Yeah, there is a danger to miss in certain information, depending on the winds. I mean, we do know if the wind is coming from the west, it will carry that information from the west towards that site. But if there were easterly wind in a different area, we would capture different information. So a crucial part of ice core science is to understand at which site we get the wind from which direction, which environmental factors are feeding our chemical records and what we see in our ice at that site. So we do need that regional understanding of the environment to actually understand our record. And it could be that certain volcanic signals are captured in one record and not in the, in the other. Because when, we, when it comes to polar ice cores, we tend to get just the largest eruptions that are in the tropics because smaller eruptions would not be captured because the wind is not strong enough to carry it that far. But a typical eruption that is captured in ice cores is the Pinatubo eruption in 1991. So we use that as an absolute time marker because we know that it happened and we can see it in different ice cores. Either, chem either chemically in the sulfate or as literal ash shards that we can sample and look at under the micros microscope. Ah, okay, so the question is, <laughs> uh, how, how long will it take uh, for two meters worth of sea level rise? Yeah, so um, that's a big, big question. <laughs> Um, it, so the IPCC currently predicts that by 2100, um, I think sea levels will rise between one and two meters, um, probably closer to one meter. Um, but it, it, a big, big question is what happens to the Antarctic ice and whether there's, um, there's a process called marine ice sheet instability, where a lot of West Antarctica is grounded below sea level. And um, if, if it starts to retreat, it could kind of fall into a very unstable pattern of retreat. And if that happens, a lot of ice will be lost and then we'll be closer to the two meters. So um, these are big questions for glaciologists and we're trying to work out how quickly it will happen. Um, but yeah, there's, there's big kind of errors on, on the estimates, but we know it's, it's rising. Yes. That seems incredibly accurate. But what do you mean with the western tropics? Um, yes, that's so we we do kind of validation studies. So there's been there was a big mission that went down to uh, the South Pole and they kind of drove around with a skidoo with a GPS and kind of measured the exact height that you, they, they with a GPS and then they could validate the measurements from the satellites to to that. Um, but with ISAT two, it's it's very precise and it will bounce off the first the surface layer of anything, um, and there's been lots of like lab tests that have um, kind of confirmed this with the instrument before it went up into space. Um, yeah, but it's pretty remarkable. If, if I can just chime in, you can also uh, calibrate uh, uh, lots of satellites uh, using salt flats, um, in particular in South America, because they're, in, they're, they're mm. basically completely level, and you can bounce signals uh, straight off them and, and get your calibration yeah. while you're in orbit. They, they put kind of big corner reflectors on the ice as well, so they know when the satellite's going over it, and they'll get a really strong return from, from, from one of these corner reflectors, um, and that's another thing they use. I think we've got time for one or two more. Okay, so, so should we be worried about things that are potentially lurking within the ice cores? Um, we do hear on the news about uh, permafrost melting and potentially releasing viruses. Is this an issue with ice cores in the Antarctic? So Antarctica is the remotest place on Earth, and it is probably also the cleanest place on Earth. And that is because it's that remote, and I can't imagine or I don't know about any viruses that are captured in that ice because it's Antarctic ice and there are no indigenous people who may have suffered from viruses in that region. So it, everything that we encounter down there should be fairly recent since we've explored the Antarctic. Um, but when it comes to permafrost, um, we've come across some 
incidents in Lapland um, in Sweden where there have been permafrost graveyards um, thawing and viruses being released that were buried in that graveyard. So permafrost melting is not just an issue when it comes to the emission of methane, which in my opinion is maybe the major one, but it could also release viruses. Maybe a, a Hollywood uh, sort of horror film. You know. <laughs> uh, okay, we've got time for one last one. So I'll give it to you, sir. What's the most interesting or alarming thing you've discovered with the NICE cores? I think it probably feeds into something we've both observed, both in ice cores and from remote sensing, and it's the increase in melting. Um, I, as an ice core scientist, see more and more of these features, melt layers, these bubble-free layers, and ice core scientists have tried to avoid studying them by going to places that were not affected by a surface melting in Antarctica. But now there's simply no way around it because the coastal regions are the ones changing most quickly and they're the ones draining ice into the sea and yeah, constraining mess loss. So we need to study these sites, but they're affected by surface melting. And I think that is probably the most remarkable thing, seeing that increase in those features and at the same time being confronted with a lack of knowledge about that. And you've seen that change of mass loss from, from space. Yeah, the statistics of how fast things are speed, how quickly things are speeding up or thinning is quite, is quite concerning. Like some of these regions are losing kind of 10 meters of surface height every year, which is staggering, really. Um, so it, it is quite, can be quite yeah, depressing <laughs> when you're looking at these on a daily basis. But um, yeah, hopefully our science can help to understand and help humans like mitigate the impacts around the world. So it's quite rewarding. Well, uh, it's a sobering end, uh, perhaps, but I'm afraid to say, folks, although our speakers are brilliant and we would quiz them all day, I'm sure, uh, uh, but uh, we, we do have to uh, put a pause on it there. Uh, so first of all, can we say thank you and a round of applause once again for our speakers, Ryan and Dorothea. There are a few more talks going on, and I do believe you guys are going back to the exhibits. And, and so if you want to ask more questions, uh, uh, please do check out the exhibits, of course. We've got a couple more talks, as I say. We've got uh, two more remaining uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the Saturday sessions. Um, remember the Penguin Parade. Don't forget that, um, if, if you're so inclined. Uh, but thank you very much for coming, everybody, and we hope you enjoy uh, the rest of your uh, day here and the rest of the Ice Wars Festival. Thank you.
And then everybody, oh. Just before we meet our speakers, there's just one or two uh, little things we have to go through. I, I see a, a few familiar faces, so apologies if you are hearing this uh, more than once, but uh, we'll just go through a few things. Um, uh, first of all, uh, you know, we're going to hear from the speakers, but we've also got a little bit of time allotted for our Q&A session towards the end, and we really do want to hear your questions. Um, we are going out live uh, onto YouTube, and we're also uh, sending this out to screens throughout the museum. So during the Q&A session, I'm going to come up to you listen to your question, and then, it's slightly awkward, I'm going to repeat it. Uh, uh, now, <laughs> now, some people have the idea that the best thing they should do is just shout, and that will solve the problem. No, no, it's so that I, I'm putting it into the microphone so that we can get it out to the speakers. So you relax, you don't have to shout or project or anything like that, we will repeat it. If I completely misrepresent your question, that's, you can shout at me, that's, that, that's fine. Uh, but uh, we're going to get on uh, with this in just a second, but as always, I'm going to do a little bit of reading so I get this right. Our speakers today are uh, Caroline and Fleur. Uh, and Caroline is a polar climate scientist with the BAS, uh, uh, whereas Fleur is a cloud physicist. Okay, just, just correct me if I'm getting this wrong. Um, uh, and together are part of the Atmosphere, Ice and Climate team with the BAS. Um, and so, Caroline, uh, your work is uh, with uh, uh, climate model simulations for future pr projections. Okay, I'm, I'm doing well with this, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Floor, uh, you are looking at uh, uh, focusing on improving the representation of, now I'm just going to say this phrase because I don't know what it means, mixed phase clouds over the southern oceans and climate models, or in climate models. That's right, yeah. Yeah, okay, excellent. Well, I haven't really covered myself with glory there, but uh, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Caroline and Floor. Um, take it away, guys. Thank you, thank you for this excellent introduction. And I think as this slide already shows, we're interested in um, also the larger picture of water in the climate system. So we will definitely focus on sea ice and clouds in this talk, um, but we'll hope to bring it back into the context of water in the climate system. So you may be all familiar with the water cycle. Um, and um, in a nutshell, the water cycle has to do with how um, uh, snow and ice from mountains um, melts um, and then via rivers and meltwater goes into the oceans where it might evaporate uh, into clouds, then condense as it goes higher into the atmosphere, condense into clouds, is transported by clouds, and then eventually um, it will precipitate in the form of rain or snow back onto the um, mountains or on the land. And this is a really, in a very brief nutshell, the water cycle. What you might not know about the water cycle is that it's also very important for the, the transport of both water and energy in the atmosphere, and it, that it has a very important role in our climate system. So we will be talking about specific parts of this Sorry, water you cycle. That. Please. <laughs> yeah, so um, sea ice is what I study. And I guess you probably don't normally think of sea ice as part of the water cycle. Now, obviously, sea ice is frozen water. But because it forms from the frozen ocean and then melts back into the frozen ocean, I guess it's not directly part of that cycle. But it's still really important for the ocean circulation and also for climate. So that's what I'm going to talk about in maybe about five minutes. You'll maybe have an idea of why sea ice matters in the big picture. And as we've now so I'll be talking a little bit more about clouds. Um, and clouds, as I mentioned, are responsible for the transport through the atmosphere of water and energy. Um, clouds are very interesting to us because it's still a little bit unclear whether they are actually heating or cooling the Earth. And they are therefore one of the largest uncertainties when we look at climate models predictions of future climate. So I'll be talking about that right after Caroline. Fabulous. So this is going to be a talk in two parts. Part one is all about sea ice. Um, so we're going to start with a very minor interactive element. And I just want a little show of hands if any of these images are what you think of when I say sea ice. So uh, one, does anyone think of, say, a polar bear uh, on some sea ice? Show of hands if that's kind of the first things. Yeah, so those of you watching on live stream, I think that was kind of most of the room. That was a raise of hands. You can raise your hands for another one as well, people in the audience. So. Um, the next one is, is a map like this. So this is um, the amount of the Arctic Ocean. So we've got America at the bottom, um, England just off the screen at the top right. And this is the amount of the Arctic Ocean that was covered by sea ice at the end of summer in 2012. So that kind of image, anyone seen that before? Think of that one. 
Yeah, so again, I think that's kind of a good proportion of the room. Um, now, I feel like I can already tell that the next ones, I'm not going to have so many hands, because I did wonder if anyone just kind of thinks of something completely different when I see CI. So if you think of anything else, kind of quick picture, then just raise your hand. I'm not going to be able to ask what it is, but anyone else? No, no other quick hands. And I already know that no one's probably going to do this, but some of you might just be like, I have no idea what sea ice is. So an anyone really not know? Ah, oh, great, cool. So we can get really stuck in. So sea ice, as I've said, is the frozen ocean. And the ocean at both poles, so the Arctic in the north and the Antarctic in the south, uh, changes a lot each year. So as we go into winter and there's much less sunlight, the atmosphere cools and then the ocean freezes. Um, and then that happens, um, and the ice can get up to um, typically a couple of metres thick, but in the Arctic it can be up to kind of 20 metres in some uh, very localised regions. Um, and then it melts back, back again in summer, and that happens every year. So just to look at some of these maps again to kind of give the big picture, this is an image of the Arctic, but this is now what it looked like this year in September. So when it was the end of summer, um, and there was just, you can see how much area was covered, and the yellow line shows what we used to expect. So we're already getting an idea here that Arctic sea ice has been changing quite a lot as the climate has been changing. Now, the end of the Arctic summer is the end of the Antarctic winter. And so this is the Antarctic on the right, and about October, it's a little bit later, um, in 2015. These are images from NASA, um, and this is an image from 2015. So we can see um, an almost circular ring of sea ice in the oceans around Antarctica. So then we fast forward about six months and we get this very different picture. Now on the bottom left, we can see Arctic sea ice now in March um, this year. So, um, and we can see that the area has covered, changed massively. Actually, the change in area that's covered from the top to the bottom is about equivalent to the whole landmass of Canada. So this is a really huge seasonal change. Um, if we look at the Antarctic, we can now see that there's very little sea ice left in, in kind of some of the bays around the coast. Um, and actually, this change, so the amount of sea ice that is um, changes in the ocean each season, is about equivalent to the whole landmass of Antarctica. So essentially, we're doubling the surface of the southern hemisphere that is covered by some kind of white frozen surface each year. So these are huge changes in the surface of the planet that happen every year. Now, the next question is, well, why do we care? So there are many reasons to care about sea ice. Some people live on it. Some people have to travel through it to do scientific expeditions or to trade. And lots of animals live on it, like the polar bear, or kind of in and actually even underneath the ice. But I'm a polar climate scientist, and so I'm interested in sea ice in the climate system. This is an image from Bass's photography archives, which shows the edge of the ice and what you can probably see, first of all, is that the left is blue, dark, and the right is white. It's bright and it's reflective. And that means that it reflects sunlight, the energy from the sun, or shortwave radiation. And that's been happening for a long time. So what then happens if we start to melt the ice through a forcing like climate change? Well, we start to melt that ice and we take away this bright reflective surface, and instead, the ocean is dark blue and absorbs heat. That is then re-emitted back to the atmosphere and the atmosphere itself warms up. So what that means is at the pole, we're reinforcing the warming that's already happening from climate change. And that could be really important for our weather systems. So one of the things that normally drives a lot of our weather systems is the fact that the pole is cold and the equator is warm. The Earth wants to transport heat from the equator to the pole, but it's spinning, and we end up with the jet streams, or the winds that flow from west to east. And they control a lot of our weather patterns in the, in the news. Sometimes if we have an extreme event, it rains a lot, it's because the jet stream's doing something strange. So if we start to mess with this pattern, because we warm the pole more than the equator, so we reduce this difference between the pole and the equator, we could mess with the jet stream, and therefore we can mess with our weather. Now, this is a really contentious issue as to just how much it's already happened and just how important it will be in the big, complex picture of climate in the future. But it does mean that these changes that are happening, and for us, particularly in the Arctic, because it's where we're closest to, are really important for what would happen in our weather. 
So that's looking up from the sea ice into the atmosphere, but we can also look down. Now, if you've been to our stand, you'll have had a bit of a spoiler for what I'm about to talk about next. And to understand what I'm going to talk about next, we need to know a concept called density. And density is mass over volume in school speech, or how much a certain amount of something weighs. So kind of how heavy something is. So different types of liquid have different density. They weigh different amounts. So on our stand, we started with an experiment where we put a green ice cube, here it's going to be a blue ice cube, in a glass of water. And on the left, we put it in warm, fresh water. What happens is that the ice cube melts, the cold water that comes from it sinks, and then that mixes, that's indicated by my arrow. So warm water from underneath comes back up and heats the surface and carries on melting the ice cube. So the ice cube goes away quite quickly. However, we have another one which is exactly the same, but I started off with salty water inside the glass. And here, we only end up with a blue layer on top, and the ice cube lasts longer. So what's different? All we've done is added some salt to the water underneath. But what salty water is, that is heavier too. So if you've ever been swimming in the sea, particularly somewhere like the Mediterranean, or if you're very lucky, the Dead Sea, it's so salty that it's much easier to float because you feel much lighter compared to the salt water. So here, although the cold water is heavy, it's outweighed by the density, the heaviness of the salty water underneath. And that means that it's much harder to mix. The cold water can't sink anymore. It stays at the surface and stays in a cold layer that keeps the ice cube. So in the climate system, a similar thing happens. Um, and each season, we, want to, um, we have sea ice that forms from salty water. Um, but then we start thinking again about density. So um, when the ice forms, although the water is salty, actually the ice becomes fresh. So you can't get that salt into the ice. So after a while, the salt comes out. So we're adding salty water to the ocean when ice forms, and that's heavy and dense and wants to mix. It wants to sink, and that's really important for ocean circulation and ocean patterns because that water wants to sink into the ocean and be carried away. A few months later, when the ice then melts, it's fresh water that wants to sit near the surface and doesn't want to mix. So we're changing the ocean through the sea ice. So we're therefore interested in what's happening in a changing world. And in a warming world, we've already talked a bit. So as the world gets warmer, in the Arctic, as we might expect, um, ice has been melting. We've seen that already with the maps earlier. And this is a time series back to 1979 Gradually, we've got the wiggles up and down from year to year, but ice has been melting. In the Antarctic, something surprising has been happening. So we've got the wiggles again, and actually a few years ago, we had a sudden drop. But you can see the line shows that there hasn't been much change in Antarctic sea ice. So there's a big puzzle there, what's been going on. And one of the reasons is something to do with this freshwater idea. And the idea is that freshwater melting from the ice sheet on top of Antarctica has made the surface of the water fresher. And like I said, that makes it harder to mix, and it helps the surface keep cold, and that could mean that it's easier to form sea ice. So we're going against this kind of big picture warming. Now, how true that's going to be, how far into the future, is one of the big puzzles that I work to understand, um, and in particular, using climate models, like Ed mentioned at the beginning. But that is a whole other topic, so do ask me at the end. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to Floor tell you about clouds in the system. Thanks. So I'm going to take you from the sea ice up into the clouds. And first of all, um, you might wonder how do clouds actually have any influence on our climate? So they're what we call radiative effects. So just like sea ice, um, the top of the clouds can reflect the solar radiation coming towards our Earth and it will reflect it back into space. So when that happens, we will have relatively cooler temperatures at the Earth. Um, but there's also something else that's happening, because clouds can also trap the heat that is emitted by the Earth and send that back to the Earth. You might be familiar with this, because we call it the greenhouse effect. We've been talking about it a lot in the context of CO2, but water in clouds can also have that effect. And that will cause a net heating at the surface of the Earth. So we've got these two influences. Then there's a bit more of a complex um, influence I've already talked about. So when 
water evaporates from the surface of the earth, it is transported into the sky, so it lifts. There it can condensate into clouds. The clouds can travel four kilometers far away and then precipitate, and when I say precipitate, I mean rain or snow back onto the earth. So this transport of water and energy um, is also an important aspect of clouds. So now you understand why whether clouds heat or cool the system is actually very complex. And it's also related to the altitude of clouds, to their geographical location, so where on earth they are situated, and also to their horizontal and vertical extent. And this is why it's so hard to um, model this in climate models um, and to get the exact interactions right, and also to understand how this might change in the future climate. So I've been talking a little bit about why clouds are important for our climate, but what exactly are clouds? Um, so we've been at the stand here for a few days now. I've asked this question to a number of people, and actually many people have been telling me that they think clouds consist or are made out of water vapor. And that's a bit tricky because yes, there is water vapor in clouds, but we can't actually see vapor. What we see when we look at clouds are actually tiny, tiny droplets, condensated water droplets that are suspended in the atmosphere. And they're suspended there because they're very small and because there's some vertical air motion keeping them there. Now these droplets, um, I'm going to ask you to imagine that we have microscopic vision and that we can really, really see at the level of this tiny droplet. At the level of this very tiny droplet in the atmosphere, we'll see molecules going constantly in and out of the droplet. And this in and out, going in and out of the droplet of the molecules, we call that evaporation and condensation. Now, this droplet is very small. We'll only have a few molecules in there. They'll be holding each other together inside the droplet, except that if there's only a very few of them, it will be very easy for, for a molecule to escape out of the droplet. Now, once they start escaping, there's even fewer of them, and they'll keep escaping. So that's evaporation happening. So what have I been telling you? Actually, my microscopic droplet is evaporating faster than it's condensating. So my cloud has just literally vanished in thin air, hasn't it? Yet clouds exist, so there's something else going on. So there's actually not just these droplets or just not just water in clouds. What if instead of only water, we would also have tiny solid particles? If we have a tiny solid particle that's soluble, so it will actually um, be so attracting water vapor onto it, then the water vapor can condense on my tiny nucleus and it starts from a larger size. And because it starts from a slightly larger size, it can keep on growing and keep on growing. It will actually grow um, in order for a tiny droplet, a cloud droplet, to grow into a rain droplet, for example, it will have to grow a million times. And that's quite a lot. So next time you'll be walking through the rain, you might appreciate a little bit more all of this work that this tiny particle has been doing to fall onto your head. So these tiny, tiny solid particles I've been talking to you about, we call them aerosol or cloud condensation nuclei. And aerosol are, uh, come from aero solution. You might have heard about it already because we've been talking about it a lot lately. Um, and they're just a suspension of tiny solid or liquid particles in a gas. Now, where might these aerosol actually come from? Um, well, we're not responsible for everything as human beings, so there is also natural aerosol in the atmosphere. Um, this image um, gives you um, a modeled image, actually, of different types of aerosol. The brown in the middle of the image uh, represents um, dust and uh, sand coming from uh, the deserts. Um, we have some uh, green in the image, which is uh, organic and black carbon, so that might be forest fires. Um, other and natural types of aerosol can include pollen, um, sea salt, we have quite a lot of that. Um, whereas human-made aerosol can come from combustion of fossil fuels or biomass burning. So as you will also see in this image, Antarctica, which is at the bottom, you can see that we have a lot of natural aerosol there. And that's why it's such an interesting region to study aerosol and cloud formation, because it has very little influence from the particles that we emit as human beings. So we can have a look at how that um, used to be before we started emitting these particles into the atmosphere. So now how do we measure clouds and aerosol? Well, we can either 
um, send a signal from the ground into the air, uh, into the clouds, and um, that signal will be reflected back and it will give us an indication of how high and thick the clouds are. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, clouds reflect sunlight, so we can use satellites to see what that signal is that's being reflected back to us, and we can have an idea of the extent of clouds and their duration. Um, but we can also go to Antarctica, and uh, we have special instruments that make images of cloud particles and of ice particles in clouds, and we can put those uh, instruments on an aircraft and then fly through the clouds and have a better idea of what clouds really consist of. And then we have other instruments which will suck air through it, and we can um, have that air um, sucked through a, um, a filter, and we take those filters back into our lab, and then we'll use those filters uh, to analyze them, and we'll search for a very specific type of par particle, which is called an ice nucleating particle. And I suggest that if you want to know more about ice nu nucleating particles, you come to our stand where we also have a number of very exciting experiments to explain to you a little bit more how uh, and what our science is about. Cool, and I'll just say that our stand isn't in the ticketed area, so do come in, it's, it's downstairs. So I'm going to finish now just by coming full circle onto the water cycle. Um, so we talked a lot about this, and we said that after uh, water is in the clouds, um, it then comes back and essentially falls of rain. Now, in the UK, we're used to our winds coming from the west, bringing moisture in and maybe rising up over the Pennines, perhaps, and then dumping rain on us. Um, and actually, a similar thing happens in Antarctica. So this picture on the right shows Antarctica, and the where there's red is where there is wind flowing from west to east. And you see the peninsula sticking out of Antarctica towards South America at about 10 o'clock, and that is a very high area. So exactly the same thing happens. Um, winds bring moisture over the peninsula and dump snow, which eventually then adds to the ice sheets and eventually, much, much later, flows into the ocean. And so the water cycle becomes complete. So this is just some of what we do um, and a picture to finish. Thank you very much to listen to us both and we would love to uh, answer loads of questions. Well, uh, thank you very much both. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, folks, we just have a few minutes. Um, I have to be very strict with time with this one, but we've got a few minutes if anybody has any questions that they want to ask. If you uh, raise your hand, and I will, as I say, a bit awkward, but I will come and repeat things. Well, I, I, can, I, can I start off with one? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, we talked about ice and we talked about clouds, and you did mention things like rain. Is there a sort of continuous model sort of from the top down or do you treat these things sort of separately you, you, you know are, are your models if you like complete can they take everything into account or are we not there yet yes so our climate models essentially they have um, most of these processes in um, but they're, they're divided into kind of blocks so actually typically our climate models they have an atmosphere component and an ocean component um, and, and a sea ice component in between. Um, and so we're, we model kind of from throughout the atmosphere in, in one block, and then we have some way of making the ocean and the sea ice communicate then to the atmosphere. Um, so the, the kind of the modeling is done a bit separately, but um, in your model kind of every 10 minutes that you imagine time has gone forward in your model or so, they will communicate with each other. So, so our climate models that we use to predict climate change are, are the, the full picture. So... I would like to add to that yeah. in terms of clouds, because we also have that in models. The problem with clouds, if I, and you've seen that during my talk, um, the scales are so different. So clouds, you can have them on very large scales, but you, I've been talking to you about the microscopic scale. And so in climate models, it's really hard to get those really small scale features in, because you would have to use a lot of computing power to get that resolved in the model. And therefore, in climate models, the representation of clouds can be still quite coarse and they rely on more precise, um, smaller models that um, feed into those really big models, the information uh, that is aggregated, actually, from the really small scales. Aggregate this is something like um, you would average it, I guess, in a certain sense. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, so, I, I, with my background in astronomy, I, I, you know, th these problems seem, uh, are very familiar. I was kind of hoping that actually you might have cracked it. <laughs> and then maybe we could just um, we can sort of steal your techniques. Uh, yep, if you bear with me.
Robert Ross, do we have the same sorts of transformations in Antarctica as we do in the Northern Hemisphere? Okay, so the question was, do we have the same kind of cloud formations in Antarctica as we do in the uh, Northern Polar regions? That's the same picture, I think, the ones you're talking about. Um, so, I would say that the formations of clouds um, kind of depend also on the orography that's beneath it. So, um, this cloud formation, you see a little bit of layering. It's a bit behind the text with the layering in the clouds. And that has to do with the wind patterns. So, um, you will see different cloud formations, um, and those are more related to the um, the um, shape, I guess, of the earth underneath, underneath if there's um, uh, mountains or any kind of, um, that will cause undulations in the, the wind patterns that will uh, actually um, go further higher up into the atmosphere and that will uh, cause turbulence in the atmosphere, which will cause the air to rise and fall, and that will cause these different uh, shapes. Um, what's different in Antarctic clouds from um, in the higher latitudes is that, um, well, it's colder, so they are colder, and we'll have these mixed phase clouds. So I've been talking about water droplets, but you can also have ice crystals. And actually, water droplets and ice crystals can coexist in a the cloud. These water droplets, they are at super cooled temperatures. So this, these are water droplets, and I will show you that at our stand, if you like. We can have liquid water at minus five to minus 38 degrees, actually. Um, so this um, liquid water um, will be present in the cloud. And these mixed phase clouds of water and ice, uh, we have them quite a lot in Antarctica. Uh, we have them also in um, more um, yeah, uh, temperate zones, but not quite as often. So that's a big difference. And, and do the high wind rates link to the cloud formations as well? The high wind influence? So the question is if uh, high winds influence the cloud formation as well. Um, actually, I don't really have an answer to that question. So uh, I, my guess is um, it would influence the clouds to the extent that, and I haven't been able to uh, address that in my talk, so thank you for the question, is that the high winds, um, they blow over the sea ice uh, and they bring uh, snow uh, particles and tiny snow crystals into the atmosphere, really high into the atmosphere. And these ice crystals serve as ice nucleating particles and um, that will allow um, these ice crystals to grow in the clouds in the first place. Uh, so yes, these high winds actually also um, bring a lot of um, nuclei into the clouds. I think we've got time for one more question. We'll go to this young man here. Okay, well, hello again. Uh, I just wanted to ask, you said you're not sure whether the clouds act more as um, tractors or the machinery that goes into the sun. Wow, that's an excellent question. It's <laughs> a great question. <laughs> and I knew I should be scared because I've seen you at the stand. I know you have very, very good questions. So the question was whether, um, was about, uh, I was saying that we weren't really sure whether clouds had a net cooling or a net warming effect, and how do we measure that? Um, well, there's something which we call um, the radiative balance. Um, so we use models and calculations. We can measure the amount of sunlight coming to the Earth and we can measure the amount of infrared radiation uh, that's being reflected back by the clouds. And uh, with, these, with this information, we can feed that into models and we get an idea of how much it warms up, um, so how, what the difference between uh, the two effects is. Folks, I, I, I know we would, we would ask questions all day, but I'm afraid I, I've got to keep us quite strictly to time. So uh, first of all, can we thank our speakers again, uh, Floor and Caroline. <laughs> And as they mentioned, they, 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 are, they, are, they are staffing the, uh, the stands, and that is not in the ticketed part. It's, it's in the learning spaces. Um, uh, and so please do go and visit. As they've, got cool, they've got cool stuff uh, uh, to look at and to, to play around with. And, of course, you can ask them other questions. Um, I, I've got a slightly odd duty. I'm going to remind people there is uh, still the Penguin Parade, uh, uh, and that will be happening at 4 if you want to dress as a penguin or I guess just follow the other people dressed as a penguin, uh, to go down onto the uh, Thames and actually uh, the captain is going to honk the horn. I keep saying honk the horn, that is not the uh, proper term, I'm sure. But, the, but yeah, please take part in that. Uh, and we have one more talk uh, for this series of sessions. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. Thank you to our speakers once again. Um, and uh, hope to see you again. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to a very final talk in our series of talks with the Ice World Festivals. Uh, my name is Ed. I'm just the host, so don't worry about me. Uh, uh, I'm an astronomer, so I don't know anything. I'm going to be listening very intently myself, um, but we're going to hear from our speaker in just a moment. Uh, before we do that, just a few quick little things. I mean, uh, as I say, it's our, our last uh, talk of the session, and uh, and we want to make sure that we include uh, a Q&A session within that. So please, you know, uh, if you've got questions, then, uh, uh, then we are going to encourage them towards the end. Uh, slightly oddly, what's going to happen is I'm going to come up uh, and uh, listen to your question and then repeat it into the mic. It sort of disrupts the rhythm a little bit. It seems a bit awkward, but it's so that people listening on the screens outside or uh, for a recording of it and uh, going out live on YouTube, uh, they'll be able to hear as well. You don't need to shout. Uh, this, this has been a sticking point during, during the last couple of days. Um, YouTube can't hear you when you shout really loudly. Don't worry about that. So uh, I'll repeat that. Anyway, uh, uh, it's my very great pleasure to introduce you to David Brand, who's our Senior Project Manager with the British Antarctic Survey. And in the talk, we're going to be listening uh, and learning about construction and habitation within uh, a pretty unique environment. That's basically it. I'm going to hand over there. Okay, welcome and, and thank you all for coming uh, so late in the afternoon and uh, uh, for the last presentation. Um, you've seen some great things uh, upstairs about all the science that's being conducted in the Antarctic and hopefully it would increase and improve our understanding of the world that we live in uh, so that we can um, uh, really sort of improve, improve the world for all of us. We can't do that without buildings and infrastructure down in the Antarctic to help sustain us uh, both working and living down there in quite a remote part of the world. So what I hope to convey today is a little bit about how we're trying to achieve our sustainability goals through the construction uh, down on the Antarctic and, uh, and really about how we're going to proceed further um, towards our sort of net zero uh, target. So the title there, Grand Designs, Sustainable Construction in the Antarctic. So I guess the first thing I need to start off is, with is what is sustainable construction? Well, simply, it sort of means using recyclable um, or renewable materials uh, in our construction process, but also to reduce our energy consumption and our waste in the long term. What does that mean? Really, it means we need to make sure that we reduce our impacts on the environment, both during construction, but also the whole life of that building. So once it's taken over by the end user, that they can actually use that building, and it reduces our um, impacts on the environment. Uh, for the rest of that building's life. So I'm the project manager working on what is the Discovery Building. That's a building that we're yet to fully build. Um, we're going down this season. It's the biggest building that the ba that British Antarctic Survey has put on the Antarctic. And it really is the hub uh, for operations uh, down in the, uh, in the continent. So there's the, uh, there's the continent of the Antarctic. Discovery Building, as I just mentioned, is one of a number of projects that have already been conducted uh, in the, uh, uh, over the continent and the, um, the islands next to it. But I just wanted to open up with, you know, we're trying to save the world here, or we're trying to uh, make the world a better place. But how on earth do we approach that? What do we do in the Antarctic to make the world a better place with our buildings? So can I open the floor and ask what you think might be some of the main challenges that we might face in putting buildings down on this continent, because that's where you really start from in order to understand what sustainability challenges we might face. So anyone want to put their hands up? So, yes. Thank you. Yeah, please, go ahead. Yep. Uh, yes, so it's a long way away. The distance is to the other side of the world. Um, and uh, we've got to get the materials down there, but not just the materials. We've also got to get people down there to actually build the buildings. And then once the buildings are up, we've got to maintain those buildings from afar. So we need to make sure that we've got buildings that we can easily fix and maintain um, once, they're, uh, once they're being put up. But there's a lady in the, the pink top. Snow. Snow. The climate, the weather. It's, it gets to minus 35 in the winter. Um, you can't really build in those sort of temperatures. Uh, so we're limited, really, um, to, to building in the summer. Uh, the weather is... Um, is it's pretty uh, inclement at the best of times. But also that weather has an impact on how we design our buildings. So if you're dealing with snow and also, um, let's say, the cold temperatures, 
um, we need to have buildings that can, uh, that can manage those sort of conditions. So a large part of the design comes into the snow. Any others? Okay, I've got some others then. We'll um, also, we talked a bit about the snow and the weather, but um, there's also very different um, sort of amounts of daylight throughout the year. Because it's so far down on the, uh, on the globe, for six months of the year, this place is pretty dark. Well, it's almost permanently dark in the South Pole for, um, for six months of the year. But out here in Rothera, you know, we're talking um, literally about an hour's worth of daylight in the, um, I, um, in the during the winter. But that means in the summer, we get a lot of daylight. So there really is only six months worth of um, window for us to actually complete construction. So construction takes a lot longer. And the other sort of challenge we have with building in the Antarctic is similar to the weather and, the, um, and getting the materials down there, we also have um, different, different occupancies throughout the year. So in Rothera itself, there's about 120 people that work down there in the summer. But in the winter, there's only 20 people. So our buildings need to accommodate different uses at different times of the year, which is uh, a huge challenge uh, for us because we don't want to be heating up big buildings in the winter for 20 people. So we've got a number of challenges here to think about when we're looking at right, what, sustainability, what sustainability benefits do we want to achieve with our infrastructure. So I'll lightly touch on this. Um, this is uh, what you see over here on the, uh, the left-hand side is some of the U United Nations um, sustainability goals. And we looked at those and thought, right, well, how can these apply to what we're building in the Antarctic? And so we've come up with these sort of eight sort of principles for all infrastructure that we build. Um, we've got there at the top, healthy working areas. So people are living down there, they're isolated, the internet is pretty rubbish, and uh, you only get literally a five-minute phone call with your loved ones every day. So we need to make sure that people feel happy in their working environment that they have things to do, that they have safe, warm places to work. Um, and so we're looking at how we look at people's welfare and well-being, as well as their function in their, in their roles. Waste and wastewater. So we want to reduce the amount of waste. All the waste that's produced in the Antarctic has to come back to the UK. So we really want to minimise the amount of waste that both construction and uh, operational lives produces down there. Um, and the same with wastewater. Can we reuse that water, that meltwater from all that snow, in the summer and actually reuse that for um, uh, um, as, as drinking water, for example, or, um, or to, uh, as, uh, to wake for wastewater. And then energy networks and climate change. So it's about reducing our carbon footprint. How can we make our buildings more energy efficient so we're using less energy to keep them heated and, and lit? The Antarctic environment, we don't want to introduce um, foreign species to the Antarctic. So when we're thinking about the construction materials we're using, we need to think about, well, is these are these going to bring in, or their transport going to bring in um, foreign um, organisms that might uh, have an impact on the Antarctic environment? Sourcing efficient use of materials. So about reducing the amount of carbon, can we actually find a way of using materials that are, that are low in carbon and, um, and, and easy to replace if we had to uh, do any works on the building? Safe and resilient communities and uh, resilient facilities. We've already mentioned it's quite a long way from, uh, from, from the United Kingdom. So we can't really afford for, for our systems down there, particularly our, our life support systems, to fail. So in our construction, we're always thinking about the resilience. So how, how well can they stand up against uh, a particular failure? And if they do fail, do we have redundancy? Do we have a backup that means that we're not putting people's lives at risk when they're working down the Antarctic? So that's it. All projects... Um, have sustainability management plans. We review our carbon um, and how much carbon is embodied within the materials that we send down, but also the carbon that we use operationally with the building, and we, commit, we complete climate risk assessments. But finally, I get on to what Rothera looks like. This is it. It's a rocky peninsula. Most of our stations are on um, the Antarctic are on ice sheets, but this one is actually on rock. So that's had... Um, uh, that's why it's quite useful for us. We can get a runway uh, down it, and we've also got a wharf at this end so we can get ships there. So it's really our sort of mobilisation hub for the Antarctic. It's from here that scientists go out to the field. There's also some science that happens at Rothera, um, marine science, but these are some of the things I saw on my last visit um, there. 
uh, penguins and, uh, and elephant seals. Um, so it's, it's really quite a fascinating and, and beautiful place to work in. And these are the existing buildings down here where this new discovery building, this operational building is going to go. So as I said, that's the location of this new building. It's a new operations building that we're putting in and it's up there as well. It's not just, um, let's say, office spaces. It has multiple, uh, multiple purposes. It's providing the power for the station, um, the possible water, the drinking water. Um, also, it's distributing some of the um, excess heat that it draws and provides that heat um, to the nearest building, New Bransfield House, so, uh, which is a, a sort of accommodation uh, eating facility. So the discovery in itself is not just a building, it's a network. And that network is the site-wide services that you can see up in this um, diagram. Another challenge for us as well is that we can't possibly stop science to go and do building work because in the, the, world, the world is not going to suddenly just stop for us whilst we get our buildings up there. So we're having to deliver this whilst um, vast scientists are still operating, still need to get to the field and do the science. And that's a big challenge. It's sat bang in the middle of this station. So a large part of our, um, our thinking is about how we build this in a sustainable way that enables science to... Uh, uh, to continue, uh, and that's why uh, most of my days are spent thinking of logistics rather than actually uh, the design and uh, and the um, I suppose the, and the, the design benefits. Um, you'll notice as well a number of things about this building. I want to pick out on this picture. So, how do we think sustainability uh, sustainable about about it? Just on its location, it's orientated so that the north face of the building is, is, wh is where the predominant wind direction comes from, and because it's on the ground. We wanted to make sure that we cleared it of snow. We don't want to use vehicles to clear snow from around this, uh, this building. Snow can almost get up to two stories high over the winter. So how on earth do we uh, remove the, uh, the snow without spending a lot of time with vehicles clearing? The wind is shaped over what is a five-degree pitch of the roof. And then down the south side, the, sort of the leeward side, I suppose, of the building, using this wind deflector, which is basically a, a big steel curved um, structure which shapes the wind down the south side of the building, thus scouring it. So the plan is we won't need to then have to do lots of snow clearing every time we go back down in the summer. It also has, what you can see from here, um, solar panels. So the building's been orientated so that the incident radiation from the sun, and you've got to think the sun is quite low in the sky because we're so, so far under the, uh, at the bottom of the world. So... It's been orientated so that we can get the best um, radiation from the sun on those solar panels. So it's our venture into renewables, let's say, with this discovery building. Later phases, we'll look at more renewables. But here, we have a combination of renewables and also, uh, well, very efficient diesel engines. It reduces our carbon. We're not quite getting there with the full net zero, but there'll be further work ahead with looking at more renewables that we can switch onto in the, in the future. So um, there's a sort of breakdown of the building. There's a lot going on in it. It's an operations building for 120 people with all these different functions. There's office space, a central store for all the clothing and the, um, and the uh, 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 stores, the food that we need to sustain us for the year. There's also a vehicles garage, a uh, medical centre, climbing wall, gym, uh, even a music centre, um, and uh, lots of workshops for the scientists to prepare the equipment and the instruments they need uh, for their uh, scientific uh, uh, work. Also, of course, the energy centre and the, the plant room. But these are some of the sort of benefits um, that we're looking at, or sustainable benefits that we're looking at from that design. I mentioned the, the wind deflector at number two and the monopitch roof to shape that wind across um, the space. Um, but also, we've got to think about the robustness of the building, number eight, and that's why we've got this concrete base around there so we're not getting vehicles knocking into the side of the building trying to clear any other snow that um, might not have been scoured by the wind. And, um, and also, uh, yeah, a service tower um, for ease of maintenance as well. So how we can get onto the roof of the building without um, you know, requiring quite a lot of work. You can get on there with the, uh, with the comms tower that um, sits on the, uh, on the roof. But what I want to do, really, is rather than show you a, a boring uh, slide here, I'd like to actually take you to the... Um, actual walkthrough, the fly-through of this building, and I'll sort of talk you through some of the sustainability um, uh, design elements of that, of that building. So there it is, it's the blue one, Discovery. 
the yellow buildings are the existing buildings. It replaces six buildings, so we're going to knock six other buildings down for this. You can see the site-wide service network. That's providing all the power and the fuel for, for boilers. Uh, the seawater comes up that run to the discovery where we create fresh water using uh, reverse osmosis plants. This is the main entrance into the discovery from the, uh, the east uh, gable end. And, uh, of course, whenever, whenever anyone enters a building down in the Antarctic, they need to go straight to the boot room, take their boots off. They're covered in snow. We don't want water, slip hazards being brought into the, uh, into the building. As I said, the building has a number of uses. This is the medical center, waiting room. And within the medical center, we have a, uh, a consultation room and um, a ward. And uh, there we are, some beds. It's been known for people in the Antarctic to get injured, so we don't have, a, we don't have any other sort of access to medical treatment, so we need to provide NHS-rated um, uh, uh, medical facility. This is the field preparation area. So all that science cargo that's coming into the building, that's going out to the field, gets put into one of these bays, and the scientists will work on it, test the instruments. They have um, access to then test those outside using the science balcony. The central store, it's where all our food and clothing is stored. Um, it's, on two, it's on two floors um, with, a, with a goods lift. But there's also a void up there, so we can actually use the reach trucks to actually lift pallets up onto the, uh, the first floor. But the heart of the building is the plant room. We have two boilers and thermal stores for um, providing some of the heated water. And in e each of these um, rooms here, you can see on the left, we have the, uh, the diesel engines. And they're kept away in room enclosures so we can stop the noise and, the, uh, and also the risk of fire um, getting elsewhere into the uh, energy centre. And here's the vehicle's garage. That door is 5.5 metres high for, one, for the biggest vehicles that we think we're going to need in the next 25 years um, at Rothera. And we've got the biggest one being snow clearing vehicles. And they have mezzanine areas there. And I said earlier on, there's also welfare spaces. So this is a multi-purpose space for people to break out and play table tennis and, and, foot, and table football. Um, any, um, education centres as well. And um, there's an education training room with good views across the... Uh, uh, the station, and also a gym. People are spend some energy when it's cold outside. You can't go for runs or go skiing up on the slopes. We have um, we have a gym facility as well for people who could be down there for 18 months working. And then plenty of office space. This is a multi this is um, a multi uh, visitor sort of space because uh, you get a lot of visitors and different scientists from all over the world coming to Rotherham. Uh, and so we need to make sure there's uh, office space uh, for them. Anyone who's been upstairs and seen the, uh, the, the virtual reality, this is the, what the Antarctic used to look like, that, mu that mural on the wall. Um, it wasn't always cold, and it wasn't always um, uh, uh, covered in ice. Further tea points and uh, an office space as well, and natural light coming through the ceiling where we can to, um, to illuminate the, uh, the central areas of the building. And this is the operations room. This is where... These guys will actually be in contact with their uh, scientists out in the field, checking that they have everything they need, whether they need further supplies. And then this is the tra air traffic control or communications tower with 360 views across Rothera to, um, uh, to sort of communicate with the, uh, the aircraft that are coming in. Okay, so that gives you a sort of like an idea of really what the building looks like and, and sort of just the number of uses that we're trying to... Uh, uh, to cover um, with it. Um, I just draw your line to draw your attention to really the red lines here, to be honest. So this building, we're trying to reduce um, uh, carbon, our uh, use of carbon, so our, our MGO, our marine gas oil uh, consumption by about 25%. Um, we're on target moment for about 35%. Um, and that's with the use of heat recovery on these generators. So whilst they're diesel generators, they do actually recover heat from both the uh, exhausts and, the, um, and also their, their sort of hot, warm hot water jackets. We're also recovering heat from the ventilation system. So when we're pumping in new fresh air from outside, cold air, we're using some of that heat from the stale air to actually heat, it, heat up that fresh air. The main thing, which I covered a lot in the design, is actually to reduce banual handling. So we're not having to go between buildings to, to um, pick up stores. We can do everything from one building. So therefore, we can reduce our, we're reducing our footprint from six buildings uh, to one. And, 
yeah, and I've already touched quite a lot on reducing the snow clearing with that wind deflector. But uh, again, if you've got fewer buildings, you've got, few, you've got less snow to clear, um, and, we can, um, and we can then focus more on delivery of science rather than the operation of the, uh, of the estate at Rothera. And then reduce whole life green, greenhouse gas emissions. So we're looking at this life cycle carbon assessment, um, which looks at the embodied carbon with all the materials that we're shipping down and also the transport of those materials, um, as well as looking at the operational carbon um, that we use. So capital carbon and operational carbon all feature in really our sort of carbon assessment and how we can keep that as low as possible um, with our buildings. It's a long way. We've only got one ship, SDA, Sir David Attenborough, and these uh, Dash aircraft to actually get mobilise people. But that's not going to help us get 236 ISO containers down there for construction. So this is one of the latest uh, vessels that we had, uh, the Wisconsin, escorted by um, Sir David Attenborough's previous ship, um, the uh, Shackleton, because uh, obviously it's not just snow and ice that builds up at the station. Uh, you get these huge big ice fields that, that take quite a, time, quite a long time to melt. So you have an escort ship trying to break through the ice for these big commercial cargo vessels. Last slide, it's not just about the design and getting the materials. We've only got six months, we've only got six months worth of construction down on the, uh, on the Antarctic. So we want to make sure that we're, we're not um, expending too much time and energy and people to actually put these buildings up. So how can we reduce the time that we actually do doing construction? Um, and this is so, some of the uh, really sort of methods of modern construction that are being looked at in the UK that we're trying to employ um, in, the, in the Antarctic. So firstly, modeling, digitization, is understanding how the building goes up as well as the design and whether there's any clashes in that design. And so we use 4D modeling, which includes a timeline for how um, the building is constructed or the infrastructure is uh, assembled. We also think about um, the modularization as well of the building. So if you can prefabricate it and, um, and also do quite a lot of build it before you build it in the UK, so mock-ups that we can then ship down, you're not having to assemble and do construction work down the Antarctic. So therefore, you know, it's like pick and play almost. You can, um, you can build a lot more uh, quickly uh, when you're down there. And also, we haven't got time for building up um, the, 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 uh, the skill set of those, of, the, of those construction teams down the Antarctic. So we actually do a lot of virtual reality, similar to what you saw, uh, you might have seen in the, um, in the stand, in order to train our crews on how to actually complete um, some of these uh, construction tasks. And the last one there, yeah, it's the modular construction which we applied in the wharf project, where um, for some basically it's a new wharf so we can actually have the Sir David Attenborough Rothera. Um, it's all modular, so it was almost um, very quickly assembled in one year and uh, actually put into the, uh, into the sea. So we were able to commission that uh, relatively quickly. It's more difficult with buildings where you've got 120 people with multiple different um, ideas of how they want to use that building. But we try to um, use the same sort of philosophy with the discovery um, with modularization, particularly of the external structure. Uh, but that's a run through um, of really just of the challenges that we face um, with delivering sustainable infrastructure and how we've approached those uh, uh, with, the, with the Antarctic Infrastructure Modernization Program. So, 25 minutes. Um, I've been given a great deal of time for questions, but are there any uh, questions? Well, first of all, can we give a, a round of applause to David Brown? Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, we, we do have a few minutes for questions, and a couple of hands went up. Bear with me, and as I say, I know it's a bit awkward, but I will repeat the questions. I'm going to restrict you to one. I'm going to be mean. Okay, so specifically uh, on the continent, what are the plans to reduce the 
the impact of all the, the people and the vehicles and everything like that that you're using. So you, you talked a lot about it uh, in terms of the building, um, uh, but in terms of all the, the uses that we put it to, how do we reduce? Uh, yeah, so um, from, a, from our perspective of phase one, it's, a, it's our tentative steps really to, to try and reduce our carbon dependency. Um, there is further phases of work which looks more at renewables, um, not only for renewables providing power uh, to, the, to the station, but also about how our transportation can become more um, uh, energy efficient. Um, and whether that's through, uh, you know, sort of um, batteries and, uh, and sort of, um, you know, charge points that we can use electricity from the, uh, uh, from the renewables that we have on station, that we're looking to put on station, and might be the, might be the way forward. But I think at the moment, BAS is very much looking at how it provides that, um, that supply with the renewables that are available currently in the, um, in, uh, you know, around us. And then from there, we'll look at how we can then transfer that across to our transportation and use that on station for, uh, for recharging, basically, um, uh, vehicles. I hope that answers that question a bit, yeah. Ah, yes, so, yeah, t uh, timelines, yeah, I, I was going to ask that the same thing. Um, yeah, um, what timelines are we looking at? It's taken, it's taken a while. Uh, we, um, we started doing the groundworks um, in the, uh, I can't remember, the 19, 2019 into 2020 year. But through COVID, we had to um, call that, uh, that year short uh, and bring people back to the UK. Last year, we still managed to go there and complete the groundworks with 20 work with, with a team of 20. So... Um, we've been able to still do construction throughout COVID, which I think is remarkable, really. And we're going back this year to put that whole building up, the, exos the actual outer skeleton is going up. With all the quarantine and the, you know, the, the headaches we have in getting a team down there, um, we're really excited about that and getting the building up. But to answer the question, 2024, November 24. So two, after we've got the building up this year, we'll, um, we'll have to spend two more years on the internal fit out and the commissioning and then hand over at the end of 24. Um, and that's pretty good when you've got, it's a year and a half from normally build us in the UK, and we're working over three more seasons of six months. So it's, it's about right. Yeah. And if you'll indulge me, can, can I just follow up? Uh, when you're talking about the lower level with the, the concrete base, uh, have you constructed a sort of plinth out of blocks, or are you mixing and pouring concrete? Yeah, so um, there is a, uh, a concrete base that goes around the, the footprint of this, um, but there's also ground floor slabs. Um, the, the ground bearing, and uh, also the first floor slab. So there's quite a lot of concrete that's gone into this building. Um, we can't make concrete down in the Antarctic because one, it's quite uh, well, it's a pristine environment, and creating concrete is actually quite a polluting um, uh, methodology. Uh, so all the concrete that we've shipped down there is actually precast, or being built in the UK and shipped down there. Uh, fortunately, it was shipped down two years ago, so uh, um, we don't have that problem this year. But yeah, it's. Uh, as many things in this building, it's been fabricated in the United Kingdom before shipment. Uh, yeah, we'll go to this young man at the front. Uh, what type of special materials do you use in Antarctica to build the building? What type of special materials do you use? Sure. Um, well, this building particularly, I wouldn't say it uses any special materials. I mean, we're using steel. Um, and there's a good reason why we're using steel, because perhaps wood would be a bit more environmentally friendly. Um, but... There's no firefighting team down in the Antarctic. So we don't really want to have a building that's made fully of wood um, because of the, uh, the fire risk. And also, we want this building to last a long time. So, um, uh, you know, it's, good. it's got a life of 50 years. Do you use any I'm trying to think. Um, yeah. Well, I think where it comes in special is um, materials is the systems that we have inside the building rather than the actual materials. So, um, yeah, the fact that we're, uh, we're combining both diesel generators and solar um, um, panels, uh, the fact that we're, uh, that we're using these ventilation systems that can recover the heat and, you know, and, and warm up the building. Um, what else? We're doing um, a, no a number of good things, really, with how we can recover heat from the generators. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so you think you're pumping a lot of warm water around this building. It doesn't all get used. It comes back to the uh, energy centre. When we recover that heat, 
and then use that to pump more warm water through when they need, when they need it. So it's, um, it's recovering that. And also, generators create a lot of exhaust. So how can you recover that heat from the exhaust? So we're not wasting any heat. Another good thing is, I've got Yes. So this is like a select committee. You're not being let <laughs> off the hook at all. <laughs> it is. Um, yes, we, it's, we need to go away from diesel um, because it's not, it's polluting, isn't it? And the only way really to do that now is with renewables. Okay. So the next phase of work is to actually bring all these renewables um, onto the station. That, and this building sort of being um, structured so that we can connect into that renewable energy uh, when it comes online. At the moment, though, we had tired buildings that we needed to replace. We had to get these new, you know, thermi um, thermally efficient buildings up. And we looked at what's the most efficient way to create um, the energy needs using the generators that we have on the, uh, you know, uh, out there now. So I think this is our, our first, as I said, our first step. But you're right. Um, to, meet, to meet that net zero target, we, we need to get away from this. But I don't think we'll ever get away from not having backup as diesel generators because you're dependent on renewables in an environment where you can't really just wait until it's windy and sunny unless you've got good battery um, storage. And so there's all, I think there'll always be a need to have some sort of diesel backup just in case. But you know, the idea is that renewable energy becomes more efficient. <laughs> Good question, isn't it? Yeah. What's the battery capacity? Right, so the, the solar panels on this building um, will be fed straight into that uh, energy network yeah. and, and used. And when, um, and when it's being used, we won't need to use the diesel so much. Okay, so we're maximizing that use of solar power. But when you really do build up all these renewable, um, this renewable energy, when you've got all these, say we're using wind turbines, you know, or even solar, we're gonna need big batteries to store that energy, but not just store it for the next day, but store it for a rainy day, yeah, in the six months, in the winter when there's no sunlight, for example, and then you haven't got any, haven't got any wind. So we need batteries that can store energy for a lot longer than I think they're currently out there. But that's, that's the challenge. So what, what, the only way really to get around this then is to have a mix of renewables. So solar, wind, um, geothermal won't work down there for where it is on the Antarctic. But it's a mix of renewables because until we can really get the, uh, the, the uh, battery power up. But there's other things coming online, isn't there? There's this, um, I'm not really a renewables expert, but there's this hydro, is it hydro cells and things like that. There's quite a lot of new technologies coming through. Yeah. God, they're the toughest questions, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, these are <laughs> tough. I, th I think we've got time for one more. Ah, good question. How much does this all cost? <laughs> and how is it funded? Who funds it? Uh, yeah, so it's, um, oh, it costs a lot of money. <laughs> um, it, it costs a lot of money because of what you're trying to do. You, you know, you're trying to send the construction team down to the, uh, uh, to the other end of the world. Um, and, into, you know, and, um, and also just the cost in getting all those materials down there. So the, um, the actual sort of the cost of construction is, you know, is near uh, sort of 50 million pounds, so it's quite expensive. But that's not just this building, that's all the site-wide services. Um, that go uh, that go around the uh, uh, that go around the station. So it's it's, in, it's basically infrastructure for the whole station, um, and that's that's funded by yeah the, the government. So it's uh, through the um, uh, United Kingdom Research Innovation um, uh, Council. So it's uh, it's uh, it's sort of funded through that. But again, we're always trying to, as I say, um, through the tender. You know, it's a government project, so through the tendering process, it's looked for value. Both in quality and you know and cost, um, so it's it's a competitive world really for this procurement. So thanks for asking that one, <laughs> folks. I, I know we have more questions, but I'm a, I'm afraid we're, we're basically out of time. Um, first of all, th can can we thank uh, David again once? That was absolutely great.
I think there will be just a short little bit of time uh, left to check out the exhibits if you haven't already. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, right, we're coming to the end of the last day of this. Um, so, so please do take every opportunity you can. Um, can I uh, ask you to give a round of applause to, for our IT team who have basically been locked uh, uh, up there for about three days, uh, getting all this sorted for us. Um, we're going to be putting out all sorts of stuff up on our uh, uh, you know, our social media, um, and when I say us, I mean Royal Museums Greenwich, but also the British Antarctic Survey. We're going to be doing all sorts of cross promotions, and uh, uh, please do, you know, keep your eye out for, for what's going on, especially over the next couple of months during the uh, inaugural mission of the uh, Sir David Attenborough. Uh, but uh, finally, just thank you very much to, to you. Thank you very much uh, for coming. I really hope you've enjoyed it. I've certainly really loved it. Um, but thanks so much for coming, everybody, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, guys.